Acceleration of gravity. Acceleration of gravity refers to the acceleration that Earth gives to objects near its surface due to the pull of gravity. Acceleration of gravity is represented by G, a lowercase italicized G. It's important to remember that it is lowercase and italicized so that you don't get it confused with the representation for a gram, which is a G that is lowercase but not italicized. So remember, italicized lowercase g refers to acceleration of gravity and it has an approximate value of 9.81 meters per second squared. This means that if there is no air resistance or any other influencing factors, the speed of a free falling object near the Earth's surface will increase by approximately 9.81 meters per second every second. So this is an approximate value. There are some places on Earth where it's a little bit less. It may be 9.7 something. There are some places on Earth where it's a little bit more. It could be 9.86. But overall, on average, you could use 9.81 meters per second squared to calculate something that you needed to use the a value of acceleration of gravity for. So it can be different, but the approximate value is 9.81 meters per second squared, and that's what you were you were you would use if you were trying to plug it into a formula. For instance, weight is calculated by using the equation W equals mg, which means m times g. W, this little w, is weight. Remember, a big w represents work. Little w equals weight. M equals mass. And the lowercase italicized g represents the acceleration of gravity. So if we had someone or something with a mass of 10 grams, then you could multiply that by meters per second squared and you'd have to do some work with the units but that's where you would end up getting your weight from. You would multiply the mass times the meters, the 9.81 meters per second squared. So it's good to know what that little italicized g stands for and it's just letting you know that the weight is the measurement of force on that object on earth near the earth's surface due to gravity. So that's why gravity and mass are in this equation together because it is the relationship between Earth's gravitational force and the mass of an object to let you know how much it's going to weigh here on Earth. Now objects will accelerate at the same rate regardless of their mass if there are no other influencing factors such as air resistance. So if two things have different masses and there was no air resistance, let's say we could put two things in a vacuum. If we could put a giant boulder and a feather in a vacuum where there was no air resistance and we dropped them, they would both accelerate at 9.81 meters per second square and land at the same time on the ground. However, there is air in the Earth's atmosphere, so air resistance is usually a factor. And it can be affected by the size, shape, and velocity of objects, but not mass. So, if something is bigger and it has a flatter shape, it's going to hit more air and have um, more resistance from the air. If something is long and narrow, it's going to have less air resistance. If something is being thrown versus dropped, then that's going to be a velocity difference. But the mass isn't going to matter as much. 
the mass isn't what's going to affect the air resistance. Now, mass does kind of play into this. If you have two boxes that are exactly the same size, one is empty, one is full. When you drop them, the mass of the full box is going to be able to overpower the force of air resistance, so it will land a little sooner because it was able to overpower and overcome the force of the air resistance, where the empty box wasn't able to overcome it as well. But if we were in a vacuum with no air resistance and we had a full box, empty box, same exact shape, and dropped them, they'd land at exactly the same time. So in our normal everyday conditions, air resistance is going to be a big factor. The size and shape of the, the, your objects that you're comparing and whether they were dropped or thrown are going to have an effect on um, the acceleration of your object, how fast it's going and how quickly it's going to be able to accelerate toward the ground. But you can still use 9.81 meters per second squared as a basic rule of thumb for the gravity, the acceleration of gravity that Earth is going to put on to objects with no other forces interacting. So it's still a good jumping off point. You would start with 9.81 meters per second squared and then try to figure out the effect air resistance had because the basic acceleration of gravity on Earth with no other influencing forces is going to be 9.81 meters per second squared. Antibodies. Antibodies are also known as immunoglobulins. And they are large Y-shaped proteins produced by B cells. Now, an antibody is used by the immune system. You might have been clued in by the immunoglobulin um, alternative name. So it's used by the immune system to identify and neutralize foreign objects such as viruses and bacteria. So if you inhale or ingest something that is foreign to your system, antibodies are going to kick in and try to neutralize these foreign objects. The antibody recognizes a unique part of the foreign object called an antigen. So it's important to remember the difference between these two since antigen and antibody are both similar to each other. So the antigen is what's part of the immune system and is going to stop the foreign objects. The antigen is a specific part of that foreign object that we're going to try to neutralize. Each tip of the Y, remember we said an antibody is a Y-shaped protein. Each tip of the Y has a peritope. And think of the structure of a lock for a peritope. And each peritope will only bind to a specific epitope. And think of it like a key. So let's look at our structure over here. We've got our antibody, which is this whole Y-shaped protein, and then we've got all these antigens up here. So there are lots of different antigens that could come into your body, and this is probably not what they look like, but it's just to give you an example. If we're thinking of our antigens and this area here is going to be our epitope, this part here that would bind, it's supposed to be considered a lock. So if this, it's supposed to be considered our key. So if this is our lock here, this antigen binding site, or the peritope, then it's only going to fit with one key. A lock is only going to be unlocked with one key. You have to have the right key to get it to unlock. So we've got our antibody and each part of the Y is only going to bind to a specific antigen. The peritope, this little shape on the end of our antibody, is only going to bind to one epitope, which is located on an antigen. 
So that one spot on your antigen is what's going to be able to bind to the one spot on the antibody. And if you don't have the right key to go in the lock or the right lock to bind with the key, then nothing's going to happen. So there are lots of antigens and different antibodies can attach to different ones of those. But one antibody is only going to be able to bind to one antigen. If you have lots of antibodies floating around in your body, each one is going to only be able to attach to one antigen. So you may have lots of them that can attach to one antigen and lots that can attach to another, but you can't just say, okay, well, I don't really have this antigen in my body. I have this one, so let me plug that in there because it's not going to fit. You have to think of it like a lock and key. So once you have this antibody produced, it's only going to be able to bind to the one antigen to neutralize it. So, once the antigen and antibody bind, and remember, special epitope-peritope relationship, lock and key, it's only going to be able to bind to one specific type of antigen. Once they bind, the foreign object is tagged for attack by another part of the immune system, or it's neutralized directly. There are some antigens some foreign objects where if we block the antigen, then that foreign object isn't going to be able to do any more harm in your body. So the antibody can neutralize it directly. But there are other foreign objects that can't be neutralized quite so easily. So instead, there is um, something secreted by the antibody and it coats the foreign object and then the foreign object is tagged for attack and some other part of the immune system steps in and removes the foreign object. So now that you've seen your antibody and seen how it binds to antigens and how it can either get rid of the or neutralize the foreign objects directly or alert the attack for another part of the immune system, let's go back to the B cells. Remember Antibodies are produced by B cells. So once a B cell has been activated, once there's some foreign object in your body that the B cells know about and they say, okay, we've got to do something now, we've got to get rid of this. The B cells can turn into antibody producing cells called plasma cells. So they can produce new antibodies. Um, these plasma cells that the B cells turned into or they can be turned into memory cells that can remember an antigen and respond faster in the case of future exposure. So these B cells can produce, turn into plasma cells that produce more antibodies if needed, or they turn into memory cells. And the memory cells are going to remember the last antigen they had and they're going to be able to respond faster. So once this antibody is attached to this antigen, it's going to remember it next time and it's going to be able to respond faster. It won't have to try all these keys to figure out which one goes in the lock. It will already know which key goes in the lock and it will be able to respond faster. So that's why if you've been sick with something before, you might not get it again, like chicken pox. Um, once you've had it, you usually don't get it again. Uh, let's see. You get a flu shot and it's got antibodies in it. Um, once your body learns how to attack that flu virus, at least that particular um, strain of flu virus, then it will be able to attack it if it comes into your body again. Now, different strains of flu virus are going to have different antigens. So it won't be able to attack every flu virus, only the ones that have that same antigen that your flu vaccine had in it. So antibodies are very helpful with maintaining your immune system and keeping you healthy or keeping any organism healthy. And the B cells produce the antibodies. The antibodies find foreign objects, find the antigen on them, and the particular epitope that it can bind to. And once they bind, that foreign object is tagged for removal. It's either going to be attacked by another part of the immune system or it's going to be neutralized directly and it won't be able to harm anything and will eventually get 
transferred out of the body. And you've got your plasma cells that are going to produce more antibodies for your body and your memory cells that are going to remember past antigens, past foreign objects that have come into your body and know how to respond to them faster in the future. So remember, antibodies are also called immunoglobulins and that will help you remember it's a part of the immune system. Remember the difference between antibody and antigen? The antibody is what is fighting the foreign object. The antigen is that specific part on the foreign object that has to be bound to to be able to attack that foreign object and get rid of it. DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid contains all of the hereditary or genetic material in humans and most other organisms. So the DNA is what lets people know what genetic material is in a person or is in a certain creature or other organism. Now each cell in an organism has the same DNA. So if someone were to get a piece of your hair and a fingernail and a piece of skin and look at it very closely and look at the DNA, the DNA in all three would be the same and it would let whoever was looking at this know that all three of those articles came from the same person. This is the same for other organisms. Each cell in the organism's body is going to have the same DNA pattern so that you'll be able to tell that it came from the same creature. Most DNA is found in the nucleus of a cell. There is some DNA in the mitochondria and then it is known as mitochondrial DNA or it would look like this if you saw an abbreviation for it. So if you see the little MT before DNA in the abbreviation, that's because it's mitochondrial DNA and it's found in the mitochondria instead of the nucleus. But most DNA is going to be in the nucleus. Now that important hereditary information found in DNA is stored as a code made up of four chemical bases. We've got adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And each one of those bases is only going to pair with one other base. They can't all pair up with any of the other three. So adenine pairs with thymine and guanine pairs with cytosine to form base pairs. And a way that I remember that is that the ones with the straight lines in their abbreviation letter, the A and T that can be made with straight lines go together, and the ones that require a curved line go together. And that helps me remember that adenine pairs with thymine, these straight lines to form A and straight lines to form T, and guanine goes with cytosine because of the curve shape that it takes to make each of those abbreviation letters. The sequence of the adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine pairs determines how the organism builds and maintains itself. So it's important to think about this. Not every organism or every person is going to have the exact same sequence of base pairs. And you might think of the alphabet. We use 26 letters to form all of our words and sentences, but the way that they're arranged, the sequence of those letters is what lets us know what word is being communicated, what sentence is trying to be communicated. And each word has a different meaning, even though it's made up of the same 26 letters or some um, subset of those letters. So it works the same way. You're going to have some sequence of adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, and those base pair sequence is going to let you know or let a scientist know what 
that organism does to maintain itself, what kind it is. Is it functioning properly? Is everything in the right order? What does that order tell us? The same way that seeing C-A-T tells us that that is the word cat. and It's talking about a mammal with pointy ears and whiskers and a tail that's kept as a pet. Let's look at the next part. Each base pair, so our adenine thymine pair or guanine cytosine pair, is going to attach to a sugar molecule and to a phosphate molecule. And once those attach, once a base pair attaches to the sugar molecule and phosphate molecule, it forms a nucleotide. And these nucleotides form two long strands that spiral into a double helix. That is the shape that DNA takes on. And I did my best to give you all an example of a double helix. It kind of spirals around. If you were to curl a ribbon around my pen, it would form that kind of double helix shape we're talking about. And you should think of a twisted ladder with the base pairs as rungs. So if we were looking at this picture here, this would be our double helix shape that's spiraling around and each one of these little rungs on the ladder would be a base pair. So we would have adenine and thymine together and they would be paired up. And then here you would have guanine and cytosine paired up. And then you would have adenine and thymine, guanine and cytosine, all the way down the ladder where you've got your sugar molecules and phosphate molecules that bound to your base pairs making up the sides of the ladder here. And you just have this long DNA chain and then the sequence that you see is going to let you know how that organism builds and maintains itself because not every creature's DNA is going to be the same. Everyone has a very unique DNA pattern. DNA can replicate or make copies of itself by splitting the ladder in half. So if we're looking at this and we just decided to go through and cut this ladder in half, we would be separating those base pairs all the way down. So then you have A, G, A, G, and any other base pairs you've got. So we know we've got adenine and guanine, adenine and guanine, and because we know what's on one side of the ladder, each strand or half of that ladder serves as a pattern for duplicating bases. Since we know we've got adenine here, we know the thing that has to pair with it is thymine. If we've got guanine, cytosine has to pair with it. Since in DNA, adenine and thymine always pair together and guanine and cytosine pair together, you will know or the cell will know, okay, I've got this DNA, I've only got half of it, but it's a pattern. If I have adenine, I need to add thymine to the other side. If I've got cytosine, I need to add guanine to the other side. So the cell will know based on that half, that strand that it gets from DNA, how to make a complete DNA molecule and be able to form that double helix and complete the DNA strand. And each new cell needs an exact copy of DNA from the old cell. Because remember, each cell in an organism has the exact same DNA. So if the DNA is replicating itself, it needs to be giving an exact copy to a new cell so that this can continue and the organism is going to continue to have the same DNA in it. So you will see a lot about DNA in biology and it's important to remember that DNA is the hereditary or genetic material. It's usually found in the nucleus. And remember which bases pair with which. Your straight lines in adenine A pair with your straight lines in thymine T. And your curve G for guanine goes with your curve C for cytosine. DNA is the hereditary or genetic material that is usually found in the nucleus, sometimes in the mitochondria. Most important thing to remember is that it's where all the genetic material is going to be found. It's a big identifier for a cell or for a, an organism. Enzymes. 
Enzymes are highly selective catalysts that greatly accelerate the rate of reactions. So they speed up how quickly a reaction takes place. Most enzymes are proteins, but some catalytic RNA molecules have been discovered. So there are RNA molecules that will catalyze reactions and help speed them up in the same way that these proteins will. And so they both work as enzymes. In enzymatic reactions, the molecules at the beginning of the process are known as substrates. During the reaction, these substrates are turned into different molecules known as products. And at the end of the reaction, the enzyme will be unchanged. The enzyme may have to change shape a little bit to bind to the substrate and finish the reaction, but the enzyme itself will be unchanged. It will not have turned into different products. It will not have gotten bigger or smaller. It will remain unchanged. Enzymes work by lowering the activation energy of a reaction, drastically reducing the reaction time. If you had to build up all that energy to complete a reaction normally, it would take a really long time. Well, whenever the enzyme works on a reaction, it lowers the activation energy and makes the reaction happen a lot faster. In fact, a lot of our metabolic processes would not be fast enough to sustain life without enzymes there to speed up the reactions. Enzymes are highly specific for their substrates. That means that each enzyme will only bind with specific substrates that fit with its active site. So each enzyme has an active site here we've got our enzyme to give you an example. This area would be the active site. So both here and here, this open area in the overall shape of the enzyme is the active site. And each enzyme has an active site. And only substrates with a similar shape that would be able to fit in there and bind without the enzyme changing shape too much will be able to fit with that enzyme and complete a reaction. So this would be your substrate. And this is where the substrate would be coming into contact with the enzyme. Here you can see the enzyme and substrate have bonded and now they have formed the enzyme substrate complex. And you can see that the enzyme changed shape a little bit to bind to that substrate. And then in this next phase, you have the enzyme product complex where the substrate has started to turn into two different molecules and separate from each other. And then in this last part, you've got your enzyme remaining unchanged and the products, two separate molecules that the substrate has been turned into, will leave the enzyme. So you can see the enzyme remained unchanged and the substrate was turned into two separate products. And going through this stage is going to lower the activation energy of a reaction. Enzymes can be affected by inhibitors, which are molecules that decrease enzyme activity. And they can be affected by activators, which are molecules that increase enzyme activity. So where you have enzymes that are raising the rate of speed of a reaction or lowering the activation energy needed, the inhibitors are going to slow that process down and the activators are going to speed that process up. So where the enzyme is acting on a chemical reaction, these other molecules can also interfere with the chemical reaction and either speed it up or slow it down. The main thing to remember about enzymes uh, is that these are highly selective catalysts and they are going to increase the rate of a reaction by lowering the activation energy needed and at the end they are going to remain unchanged. Genes. A gene is a molecular unit of heredity 
of a living organism. A gene is the basic instruction, a sequence of nucleic acids. So a gene is going to be the instruction, it's going to be the sequence of nucleic acids that tells the cell to code for a certain protein or for a certain RNA chain. It isn't just one little thing, it's a sequence that gives an instruction to the cell. While an allele codes for one variant of that gene. So if you've heard someone say, oh, she has really good hair genes, or she's got the gene for blue eyes, that's not exactly true. Because everyone has a gene for eye color or hair color, and for every other trait that you have. But what determines what color your hair is, or what color your eyes are, is going to be the alleles for that gene. So there are dominant alleles and recessive alleles. And if you have even one dominant allele, then you're going to have the dominant gene. If you have two recessive alleles, then you will have that recessive gene. For instance, if you have two parents that have brown eyes, you could still end up with blue eyes because blue is a recessive gene. So both of your parents had one dominant and one recessive brown and blue eye color allele. The brown would have been prevalent in both of them. But since they both had that recessive blue allele present, you could still end up with blue eyes because of the recessive alleles combining. And I know that all sounds a little confusing, but it's just to tell you that each gene doesn't determine something all on its own. It's the alleles that are the variants of that gene that determine what the outcome of each gene sequence is. Genes do specify all proteins and functional chains. So they specify how these are going to be created, uh, the functional RNA chains. Genes hold the information needed to build and maintain an organism's cells and pass genetic traits to offspring. So where I was talking about two parents that could have brown eyes and still pass on the blue eye color, it's because of the alleles that they carry, whether dominant or recessive, whether you can see it as a physical trait or not, your parents carried genetic traits and they passed those on to you. And some of your physical traits may not all be the same as one or both of your parents, but the genetic traits that you got did come from the alleles that they had combined and mixed together. So you took some of your um, mother's alleles and some of your father's alleles and when those combined you ended up with different alleles and different genetic traits of your own. But they both came from the genetic traits your parents had. Some examples are eye color number of limbs and blood type. So some genes you can see right away manifested, such as eye color or number of limbs. But blood type is something that you would have to do a little more scientific research to discover. Um, you can also search for certain markers in your body for um, diseases such as Alzheimer's or um, other hereditary diseases. Those can be tested for and your DNA will show, your genes will show if you have a likelihood of getting that disease. And so that's definitely not something you can see just by looking at someone. It's something that you'd have to do more research into. But it's possible by looking at the genes in your body. Now for a gene to create or code for its protein, it must go through transcription. And transcription is where single-stranded messenger RNA, or mRNA, is created that is complementary to the DNA from which it was transcribed. And we'll look at that over here in just a minute. But basically, you're starting with DNA, and you're transcribing it into the messenger RNA. And then the messenger RNA is going to bring the message elsewhere in the cell. So, next comes translation. That messenger RNA is used as a template for synthesizing a new protein. Transfer RNA, or tRNA, brings the amino acids and anticodon necessary for protein synthesis. And something to remember is that genes are read three nucleotides at a time 
in units called codons. So you look at the three uh, nucleotides that are, that are coding for this one protein and they're going to be transcribed onto messenger RNA which is going to travel elsewhere in the cell and transfer RNA is going to bring the amino acids and the anticodon that match up with that set of three, with that codon, and let the protein be created. So let's look at that over here. Let's pretend this gene sequence came from a strand of DNA. And remember your bases are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. So we are going to say it's going to change from DNA to the messenger RNA. So we're transcribing here and each base must be transcribed. So here we've got our transcription. So the guanine is going to transcribe to cytosine cytosine to guanine, thymine to adenine, cytosine to guanine. There we go. Thymine to adenine and thymine to adenine. So the messenger RNA is going to carry this sequence. So you can see how it, it isn't exactly what was on the DNA. It's what base would have paired with the DNA. So it's kind of like a code you've got to sit here and figure out. You've got to decode what the messenger RNA says. So the messenger RNA has the pairs that would have gone with the DNA and so in comes your transfer RNA which is going to have its amino acids and the anticodon that's necessary for each of these. So each set of three is a codon and it gets transferred over and so now the transfer RNA is going to come in and it's going to bring what we need. So it's going to say okay we had cytosine so now we need the guanine. I guess we should really point this way and then it's going to bring cytosine back to pair with the guanine, thymine back to pair with adenine, cytosine back to pair with guanine, thymine to pair with adenine, and thymine to pair with adenine. So now in a different part of the cell you've got this these codons and they're gonna pro, they're gonna code for a certain protein and this is what happens in the cell. So this part would be your translation. So you've got strands of DNA Part of the cell says, oh, I need a certain protein. Well, this codon codes for one of the proteins you need, and this codon codes for one of the other proteins you need. So the DNA is going to send it. The messenger RNA is going to hold the transcription, which is where it's changed to what the pairs would be, what pairs with each base is going to be the transcription that goes on the messenger RNA. And then the messenger RNA travels off into the cell to where the protein is needed. The transfer RNA is going to bring the bases plus amino acids. And then you're going to get these bases plus the new amino acids are going to give you your proteins that these codons were coding for. So you've got your transcription where it's coded onto the messenger RNA and then you've got translation where it's decoded and the transfer RNA brings in what you need plus amino acids and your proteins are created. So that's kind of a complicated process but it's what genes do. That's their job. Their job is to send messages throughout the cell so that new proteins can be created and they are going to carry your hereditary information and they have the basic instructions necessary to tell your body how to carry out the hereditary processes and keep producing the genes that you keep producing the cells and the proteins that you need and maintaining your cells. So just keep in mind genes are units of hereditary information 
and they carry messages throughout the cell and instruct the cell on how to create the proteins that your body needs. Meiosis. Sexual reproduction in eukaryotes involves a form of cell division known as meiosis. It has several different stages that are carried out to let one diploid germ cell result in four haploid gametes. And diploid means that it's going to have multiple copies of the genetic information where haploid means it's going to have one copy. So, in this first part, this would be interphase. And it's kind of before meiosis starts, but it has to do with it because this diploid germ cell contains genetic information from both a, a maternal and paternal parents. So you've got female and male genetic material in this one diploid germ cell and it's getting ready to divide to carry out sexual reproduction. So we have replication going on in here because each chromosome is going to double itself so that there's extra genetic material to carry out this process. In the next phase we have prophase and the replicated genetic material is going to line up in homologous pairs, which means that each one is the same genetic material. It's an exact copy. And they're going to cross over a little bit at these points here. And where those cross over, they kind of swap a little bit of genetic material. So each one of these pairs is going to take a little bit of the other pair and that is called crossing over or recombination. So you're just kind of jumbling up the maternal and paternal bits before the um, division starts to take place. Then we move on to metaphase. And in metaphase, your centrosomes are starting to pull the homologous pairs apart. And then we move on to anaphase. And you can see they actually are getting pulled further apart. They're not crossing over anymore. And they're starting to move to opposite sides of the cell. And these are all prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, because this is kind of a two-step process. Then we keep going, and we've got telophase 1. In telophase 1, there's the cleavage furrow that's preparing for the cells to separate and become two distinct separate cells. There is a nucleus being reformed. The microtubules that have been connecting the chromosomes and pulling them apart have receded and the genetic material is encased in a nucleus again. And then this last part is cytokinesis 1, where the cytoplasm is split and there is a definite split made between those two cells, so now there are two diploid daughter cells. So we had our diploid germ cell the DNA, the genetic material was all replicated, so there was twice as much. We went through this cell division, so now each one of these daughter cells is a diploid daughter cell, and it has uh, twice as much genetic material as it needs to be a haploid gamete. So we're going to go through what is known as meiosis II, the second step in this process. So we have prophase II. And in this phase, you'll see we've got the two daughter cells, and now they are kind of repeating the same process that happened up top. So there's no replication because that was an interphase, but 
they are going to start having the centrosomes move down to either side and um, start moving out to opposite poles of the cell and start pulling the chromosomes that way. In the next phase, we've got metaphase 2. You can see that the chromosomes have lined up along the equatorial plate in both of these daughter cells. The microtubules are connecting them to the centrosomes and they're going to start pulling apart. So in our next phase, anaphase 2, you can see that actually happen. The chromosome pairs have gotten pulled apart and now these individual chromatids are on separate sides of the cell and they're still going to be kind of being reeled in by the microtubules at this point. And we move on to telophase 2 where we've got a nucleus forming around our new pairs of genetic material that have both the um, mother and father genetic material in each nucleus. They're all split up now and we have the cleavage furrow again. The cells are getting ready to divide permanently. Your centrosomes have separated to the opposite side still and the microtubules have retracted. And then we go to cytokinesis 2 which is where the cytoplasm divided between these two new cells and these two new cells, and now we've got four haploid gametes, which means that they each just have one set of genetic information, and they're going to need a partner to be able to um, reproduce. So these gametes are going to be ready to be fertilized, and when they, they are fertilized, a diploid zygote will be formed. So these gametes are ready to be fertilized and if they are then they can go on to create a new eukaryotic organism. So meiosis does have a two-part process and it goes through the same phases as mitosis but they're a little bit different because instead of just getting an exact copy you're mixing genetic material from two different organisms, a maternal and paternal parent and at the end you're going to have the four haploid gametes that each has genetic information from both parents. Mitochondria. When you see the word mitochondria, you're looking at the plural form of the word. The singular form is mitochondrion. So whenever you see those, don't be confused or think you're looking at a different word. It's just the singular and plural forms. First, let's talk about the structure of mitochondria and then we'll talk about its functions. So the structure of a mitochondria. If you see it floating around in the cytoplasm, it kind of looks like a jelly bean. If you can see a cross cut out of it, then you're going to see this little squiggly membrane going through the middle there. So let's look at what each part of the mitochondria is. This outer layer that you can see is called the outer membrane. Next, this space in here between the outer membrane and this next line is called the intermembrane space. And then this next line is the inner membrane. So that makes sense, right? You've got your outer membrane, your inner membrane, and then the space between it is just the intermembrane space outer, inner membrane, intermembrane space, the space between the two. Next you've got the space created through all these little zigzaggy patterns of the inner membrane and the spaces that are created here and in there and down in here between where it zigs and zags and you've got that space between each little fold that is called the cristae. And then, last but not least, everything inside that inner membrane is called the matrix. So there you've got your structure of a mitochondrion, the basic parts of it. And it's important to know that they are found in nearly all eukaryotic cells. 
So that's not all, but most eukaryotic cells, and that's going to be your larger cells, the ones you find in plants and animals. And within the cell, it's going to be found in the cytoplasm. So you will see mitochondria floating around in the cytoplasm. And you could have one or you could have lots of mitochondria. It kind of depends on how big the cell is. But the basic structure is going to be outer membrane, intermembrane space, inner membrane surrounding the matrix with the cristae forming in the folds between that inner membrane. Okay, let's look at the functions. Mitochondria produce adenosine triphosphate, which is known as ATP. So if you see ATP, it's an energy source and it's called adenosine triphosphate. But a lot of times this is not going to get all typed out. You're just going to see ATP because it's a very common abbreviation in biology. Now, ATP is produced through cellular respiration. which is also known as aerobic respiration. And that's because it involves oxygen. It's basically the cell's breathing cycle where it gets to take in oxygen and use it. So aerobic respiration or cellular respiration are basically the same thing. It just may, they may, whoever's typing or writing the paper or information you're looking at may use cellular or aerobic, but basically it's gonna refer to the cell taking in oxygen. Now, the set of reactions that produces ATP is known as the Krebs cycle. So, the mitochondria is involved in the Krebs cycle because it goes through some of those reactions to produce ATP. And the mitochondria is sometimes called cellular power plants or powerhouses because they create the cell's primary energy source, which is ATP. So since they create the primary energy source that the cell has to use, they are called cellular power plants. They also can regulate the cell's metabolism, and they are involved in cell division, cell growth, and cell death. So all of these processes require energy and since the mitochondria is producing the primary source of energy it makes sense that the mitochondria would be involved in a lot of these processes. It has a lot of important jobs but the most important is going to be producing ATP because that is the primary source of energy for the cell and the mitochondria is what produces it. So it's very important to remember production of ATP, power plant of the cell, for mitochondria because that is what you're mainly going to see it associated with. Now it can also do these other things, regulating metabolism, being involved in cell division, growth and death, but main thing to remember is producing ATP. And you've got your structure, so remember outer membrane, intermembrane space, the space between the two membranes, inner membrane, cristae between those folds, and the matrix. Remember that mitochondria are going to be found in eukaryotic cells, and they're found in almost all eukaryotic cells, but not every single one. And most eukaryotic cells will have at least one, but they could have a lot of mitochondria, and you're going to find them in the cytoplasm. So just remember, if you're looking at a cell diagram, you're looking for that little jelly bean shape, and if you're thinking about what does a mitochondria do, think about producing energy, producing ATP. The mitochondria is your power plant of the cell. Mitosis. Eukaryotic cells reproduce asexually by dividing into two genetically identical daughter cells. Now they do this by the process of mitosis. So let's look. This first phase is called interphase, and it's not really considered a part of mitosis, but it's usually discussed with mitosis because it happens at the beginning, right before mitosis happens. It's the buildup to mitosis. It's a period of cell growth, 
and DNA replication. So the cell gets a little bigger, the nucleus gets a little bigger, the DNA replicates so there's more of it for the mitosis that's about to happen. Chromosomes are in the form of uncondensed chromatin. And the nucleolus may still be present. So, this would be our uncondensed chromatin. This darker dot here would be your nucleolus that you could still see. And these little pieces here would be your centrosomes. So whenever you see them along the rest of mitosis, remember these are the centrosomes. Okay, first stage of mitosis is going to be prophase. In prophase, the chromatin condenses into discrete chromosomes. So remember, it had gotten, we had uncondensed chromatin that the DNA had been turned into. In prophase, it condenses into discrete chromosomes. So instead of a bunch of DNA squiggled up, you've got discrete chromosomes that kind of look like little squiggly X's. The nuclear membrane breaks down. So where we had a complete nuclear membrane here, it starts to break down a little bit. And sister chromatids are joined by centromeres. So what they mean by that is this would be your chromosome and these sister chromosomes are, or chromatids are joined by these centromeres. So this would be your centromere. And then each of these would be sister chromatids that form the chromosome. The centrosomes are going to move to opposite poles of the cell. So remember we just kind of had them in the cell here. Now they've moved to opposite sides of the cell, so they're opposite each other and they're kind of equally spaced in the cell. The chromosomes have paired up to form sister chromatids connected by a centromere. And now we're ready to move on to our next phase, which is metaphase. In metaphase, the chromosomes align at the equatorial plate. So where they're kind of just all over the place, they've lined up at the equatorial plate, which means that it's equally distanced from both of those chrom from both of those centrosomes that have spaced themselves out at either pole. The microtubules attach sister chromosomes to the centrosomes. So you've got your centrosomes and these are your microtubules. that are attaching the chromosomes to the centrosomes. They've lined them all up along this equatorial plate. And now we're ready to move on to the next stage of mitosis, anaphase. In anaphase, the centromeres divide. So remember your centromere was that little center here that was kind of holding the two chromatids together. So in anaphase, they divide. The microtubules shorten, so where they're longer, they shorten up, moving paired chromosomes to opposite sides of the cell. So we had these paired chromosomes, and now the microtubules are shortening. They're moving those individual chromosomes over closer to the centrosomes now. And then you're ready for the last phase of mitosis, which is telophase. In telophase, the cytoplasm divides along a cleavage furrow. And so you can see how it starts to kind of dip in. It cleaves in half, and so there's that cleavage furrow, and that's going to show you where your cytoplasm is going to eventually split completely off and form two new cells. The chromosomes condense to chromatin. Remember, that's what we had up here. We had all the squigglies. They're going to just start condensing to chromatin, not a discrete chromosome anymore. 
and the nucleolus reappears and the nuclear membrane is going to be reforming around a clear nucleus. So you see the nuclear membrane is forming around where you're um, condensing D or your uncondensing chromosomes are and your nucleolus has reappeared. So once these cells split off, then this is going to be a nucleus again that looks much like this with the uncondensed chromatin and the nucleolus in the center. Two daughter cells, as we discussed at the beginning, two identical daughter cells will be formed once cytokinesis is complete. And cytokinesis is that process of the cell being cleaved in half to form two new identical daughter cells. So this is mitosis. It is how a eukaryotic cell can reproduce asexually. It just divides into two identical daughter cells. It goes through interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So it starts off with this uncondensed DNA, this uncondensed um, chromatin genetic material. The chromosomes form little pairs and the centrosomes come to either side. The centrosomes attach to the centromeres with microtubules and those chromosomes line up along the equatorial plate. Then they split apart, starting to look like two new cells now, and each part of the chromosome pair goes toward a centrosome so that they are split equally across the cell. And then they split apart, forming a new nucleus with a nucleolus and cytokinesis is going to be complete once this cell finishes cleaving in half. So just remember that eukaryotic cells can reproduce asexually by mitosis. Nucleic acids. Nucleic acids consist of a linear chain of nucleotides. So that leads us to ask, what is a nucleotide? Well, a nucleotide is going to consist of a nitrogenous base, which could be a purine, such as adenine, which is usually abbreviated with A, and guanine, which is usually abbreviated with G. Another nitrogenous base is a pyrimidine, another type of nitrogenous base, is a pyrimidine, and those would be cytosine, thymine, and uracil. After you get your nitrogenous bases, you also need a pentose, which is a five carbon sugar. The most common ones you're going to see are ribose and deoxyribose. And once you have your nitrogenous base and your pentose group, you need a phosphate group. And when you put all three of these together, you get your nucleotides. So let's look at some common nucleic acids. First we have ribonucleic acid, or RNA which consists of the sugar, ribose, so our pentose, our five carbon sugar ribose, plus adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. Those would be the, nitro the nitrogenous bases that you're going to use. And ribonucleic acid, or RNA, is usually single-stranded. The next one would be deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, and you notice that NA in both of them is there. It stands for the nucleic acid part. The first letter is telling you which sugar it's going with, which pentose. So deoxyribonucleic acid is going to be with the sugar deoxyribose plus adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And you might notice that RNA is going to use uracil as its second pyrimidine, where DNA is going to use thymine as its second pyrimidine. And that's how it always is. 
RNA is going to use uracil, DNA is going to use thymine. So you need to remember that part. DNA can be single or double stranded. It is a bit more advanced or complex than the RNA, so a lot of times it is double stranded, but it can be single stranded as well, where RNA is usually going to be single stranded and only rarely double stranded. Something to remember as well is that adenine always pairs with thymine or uracil and guanine always pairs with cytosine. And the way I like to remember that is that the curved letters, guanine and cytosine, our abbreviated letters, go together. And then our letter abbreviations that are either the made with straight lines like A and T go together or vowels go together. But if you just remember that the curved letters go together, you can always pair up G and C and then pair up whatever's left. And it will be adenine and thymine and DNA and adenine and uracil and RNA. Genetic information is carried by DNA in all organisms and most viruses. However, some RNA, some viruses use RNA. So, um, most viruses will use DNA for their genetic material, but some viruses will use RNA. So you can say, see that nucleic acids are very important for cells. Um, they're made up of a nitrogenous base or series of bases that are going to pair together the same way every time, uh, pentose or sugar, and a phosphate group. And once you get your nucleotide chain and, turn, and it forms this nucleic acid, you can name it based on which sugar is joined with the rest of it. So ribose formed ribonucleic acid, deoxyribose formed deoxyribonucleic acid, and the nucleic acid's most important function is carrying genetic material. It's going to be carrying the genetic material for all cells and organisms. Plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is also known as the cell membrane or the cytoplasmic membrane. It separates the interior of the cell from the outside environment. So it being called the cell membrane makes sense because it surrounds the whole cell and keeps it safe from the outside environment. And the cytoplasmic membrane also makes sense because it's holding all the cytoplasm in. It's a membrane surrounding all the cytoplasm in the cell and protecting it from the outside environment. The plasma membrane controls the movement of substances into and out of the cell. So it controls what passes into the cell and what passes out of the cell. So if there are things that are waste and need to get out of the cell, the plasma membrane is controlling that. If the cell needs something, the plasma membrane is going to be what lets it in. And the plasma membrane is composed of a phospholipid bilayer and embedded proteins. Now a phospholipid bilayer, you may not have heard of before. So let's describe it. The phospholipid bilayer consists of many phospholipid molecules arranged into two oppositely facing layers. So this thing here would be your phospholipid bilayer. So bilayer because it's technically two layers of these phospholipids. And you can see how it kind of looks like it could be making a wall and this whole thing would go all the way around the cell. Now, these top parts are phosphate groups. And these are 
fatty acid tails. So you've got phosphate group and fatty acid tails, which are like lipids. So you get your phospholipid bilayer because you have two layers of it. And these phosphate groups spacing out bunch together and they repel some things. So they're going to repel what the plasma membrane wants repelled and then they'll kind of open up and let through what the plasma membrane wants to let through. The plasma membrane also helps anchor the cytoskeleton to provide shape or structure to the cell. So the cell kind of looks like a big blob or a very small blob and the cytoskeleton helps give it some shape and the plasma membrane kind of holds that cytoskeleton in, sh in, in place because otherwise it doesn't have anything to anchor to, to hold on to, to keep that shape. The plasma membrane attaches to extracellular matrix and other cells to help group those cells together to form tissues. So on the inside, the plasma membrane is holding onto the cytoskeleton and helping give the cell shape. On the outside, the cell membrane is reaching out to the extracellular matrix, to what's outside of that cell, and holding onto other cells to help group them into tissues. Because you usually don't see one cell by itself. Your body is made up of lots and lots of cells and those cells group together to form tissues and the tissues group together to form organs and all together your organs um, form up your body and make you who you are. So the plasma membrane has a big role in that. Now something to remember is that plants, bacteria, and fungi also have a cell wall which goes outside of the plasma membrane and it blocks out the passage of larger molecules. So the phospholipid bilayer is going to keep out teeny tiny little molecules but this cell wall is going to keep larger molecules from even getting close to the cell. So you might consider like a piece of fabric the kind of plasma membrane. More stuff can get through it, it's more flexible, where maybe a piece of cardboard would work for the cell wall. It's more rigid, it doesn't bend as easily, not as much is going to get through. Something can get through the cell wall, just as something can get through the plasma membrane. But the purpose is to try to keep out anything that the cell doesn't need or want in it and to let in what the cell needs. So. Plasma membrane has a few main functions you should remember. It is protecting the interior of the cell from the outside of the cell and limiting what comes in and what goes out. It is helping give shape to the cell by anchoring the cytoskeleton and it is going to join with other cells to form tissues because cells aren't usually going to be by themselves. So the plasma membrane is a pretty important part of the cell. It's what keeps each cell separate from the other. Proteins. Proteins are large biological molecules consisting of one or more chains of amino acids. Which are known as polypeptides. So a polypeptide is an amino acid chain, not just an amino acid, but the whole chain of them connected. Now proteins have different structures based on how many of them are present. So the primary structure of a protein is its amino acid sequence. So just the one chain, the one polypeptide chain, and what sequence those amino acids are taking. The secondary structure is the regularly repeating local structures stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Now this is whenever we've got a few proteins interacting together and the local structures or the regular um, structures that these proteins will form just all on their own without any help. And some examples would be the alpha helix, beta sheet, and turns. So those are just some different shapes that the proteins can take whenever there are a few of them joining together with hydrogen bonds. Now the tertiary structure is getting more complex. It's the overall shape of a single protein molecule. So enough proteins have joined together to make a whole molecule 
and the tertiary structure is referring to the spatial relationship of secondary structures to one another. So you've got your alpha helices, your beta sheets, and your turns, and it's how they interact together and what kind of shape they all form whenever they form into a single molecule, and you've got proteins joining together and then more proteins with hydrogen bonds joining together into a larger molecule and what that molecule looks like spatially. The quaternary structure is going to be the structure formed by several protein molecules. So you can see how we just keep adding proteins here to get different structures. And the more that are added, the more different that these um, structures are going to look because they're getting more complex. So several protein molecules are joined together in the quaternary structure, and this is usually called a protein subunit. So it's no longer one molecule, it's multiple molecules. So it's a subunit which functions as a protein complex. So it's going to be more complex, it's going to be able to process more complex functions. And a lot of the time what you're going to see is the quaternary structure of a protein because you have lots of them together and they are drawn toward each other and then they bond. Now let's look at some of the functions of proteins. We have structural proteins. And these give stiffness and rigidity to biological components that would otherwise be more fluid. They wouldn't have a lot of shape to them. An example is keratin. Keratin is a protein found in our hair, nails, um, in birds' feathers, and in animals' hooves. And it gives them a hardness that they wouldn't otherwise have. It's not a part of your body like your skin or an organ. And you can feel they're a lot harder than your skin would be. Um, like your nail and your hair don't feel the same as your skin feels or as your internal organs would feel. And that's because they have this protein present that gives them more rigidity. So structural proteins are going to make things stiffer and give them a harder shape. Next we have enzymes. And enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. So there's a chemical reaction that needs to take place, but it won't be able to take place until this enzyme is present. When the enzyme is present, it catalyzes the chemical reaction and speeds it up and lets it occur. Next, you've got receptors. Proteins that function as receptors bind a signaling molecule to induce a biochemical response. So it receives that signaling molecule and then it binds it somewhere that will induce the biochemical response that needs to happen. Next you have antibodies which are also known as immunoglobulins and these bind antigens and target them for destruction. So an antigen is a foreign body that comes into the cell and it's not welcome, it's seen as the threat and so these antibodies or immunoglobulins are part of the immune system and they bind to the antigens or that foreign body and they target them for destruction so that then they are destroyed and removed from the cell and the threat is eliminated. We also have motor proteins and motor proteins generate the forces responsible for muscle contraction. So think about your motor functions, being able to move your muscles, being able to move around, all of those are, um, are able to happen because of these proteins, these motor proteins. So if you're able to move your arm back and forth, if you're able to close and open your hand, those are responsible, uh, those are happening because of muscle contractions and those muscle contractions are generated by motor proteins. If we didn't have those, we wouldn't be able to contract our muscles like we are. Next we have pump proteins. So these are proteins that act as a kind of pump and they transport ions or small molecules across a membrane. So you've got a cell membrane or an intercellular membrane and the po proteins can act as a pump and push these small ions or molecules across the membrane and that is their primary function as a pump protein is just to transport these small molecules or ions across the membrane. 
Lastly, we've got switch proteins. And these act as an on-off switch based on the presence or absence of certain other molecules in the cell. So if a cell was waiting for a certain molecule to be present to do something, then the switch protein is going to act as an off switch and keep the cell from performing that function until the certain molecule it's waiting on is present. Once it's present, it flips the switch and says, basically, it's on. It can perform this function now. So it acts as a, like an on-off switch for the cell. As you can see, proteins are very important in a cell. They actually can make up a large percentage of the components of a cell. For instance, you could have a cell that was made up of maybe 3% DNA, which is really important. You have to have the DNA encoded correctly for everything else in the cell to function. But the protein could make up almost 50% of that cell's components. So while it isn't maybe as biologically important as that DNA is, it makes up a big part of that cell and not much would be going on if it didn't have protein there as well because protein has a lot of functions. So you can see that proteins are very important for cell life and lots and lots of cell functions. Punnett square. A Punnett square is a diagram of every possible combination of a maternal allele with its paternal counterpart for each gene investigated in a crossbreeding experiment. So that means if you were going to try to crossbreed two plants, say one that had red blooms and one that had white blooms, you could do a Punnett square to predict how many different plants would come out red and how many would come out white and how many might come out pink and this just would put out all the options and from that you could figure out the ratios and if you planted a hundred of these plants or crossbred a hundred of these plants you could predict how many of them would come out which color if color was the trait you were looking at. So let's look at some examples. A monohybrid cross considers only one trait in the cross. So mono means one so we're only going to be considering one trait in the cross. So we're going to look at a tall maternal pea plant and a short paternal pea plant. So we're looking at peas and the big T is going to represent the dominant allele and the lowercase t is going to represent the recessive allele. So since the big T is dominant, any time the big T is present, the, it's going to take precedence. So the big T means tall. So since we have two big T's, we know this is going to be a tall plant. If we see a big T and a little t, it's still going to be a tall plant because a big T is present. The only way we get a short plant is with two little t's because it is recessive and so you must have both alleles be short alleles to get a short pea plant. So let's look at how this looks in the Punnett square. So what we're looking at is a tall parent that was dominant and a short parent that had both alleles recessive. So let's combine them. We're going to put the big T with the little t in this box, big T with little t in this box, big T with little t in this box, and big T with little t in this box. So since we have four that are a combination of a big T and little t, this would give you a phenotypic ratio of four. We only have tall plants in this combination because every time a dominant allele will be present. The phenotypic ratio means what it what the plant's going to look like. So this will be tall, 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 tall. It didn't it wouldn't matter if we had a pair of alleles that were both dominant or if we had a pair like this where there's a dominant and a recessive. It would still be tall and so that's all we're looking at is what it looks like, not what the alleles actually uh, what the letters of our alleles are and the Punnett square. So since they're all going to look tall, 
Our phenotypic ratio is four. They will all four be tall. So let's look at a different one, and I'm going to kind of draw us a line to keep us separated. And this one's going to be a dihybrid cross. And a dihybrid cross considers two traits in the cross. Di means two, mono means one. So we've got our dihybrid cross that's going to compare two different traits. So we're going to look at a tall wrinkled parent and a tall round parent. So again, the T's are going to be the same. If we have two big T's, it'll be tall. A big T and a little T, tall. Two little T's will be short. Your R's are going to stand for whether it's round or wrinkled. So the big R is the dominant allele and it codes for round peas. Round peas are the norm. Wrinkled peas are going to be that recessive gene. So a, a big R and a little R are still going to give you round peas because it, is, it includes a dominant allele. And the two little R's would give you the wrinkled peas because that is the recessive allele. So if all you have are the two recessives, you're going to get those wrinkled peas. So this is a parent that has a dominant and a recessive allele for tall and two dominant alleles for round peas. And another parent that has a dominant and recessive gene for tall and two recessive genes for, for wrinkled peas. And we're going to look at what we get in our Punnett square with this. So we have big T, big T, big R, little r. So this is going to give us tall and round because we have two dominants and a dominant and a recessive. Moving across, we have two big T's, a big R, and a little r. So again, we're going to get tall and round. Next, we've got big T, little t, big T, or big R, little r. So again, it still includes two dominants, so we're going to have tall and round. Big T, little t, big R, little r. We still have a dominant T and a dominant R, so it's going to be tall and round. Okay, moving on. Big T, big T, big R, little r. Tall, round. And if you notice, these two are the exact same. So what you're going to put all the way across is going to be the same as what you had above it. Since we had a big T, big R, big T, big R, so the results going across the board are going to be the same. So all of these will also be tall and round. And if you wanted to go across and check them all, you definitely could. And just look at it. Big T with this little t, we've got it. Big R with this little r, we've got it. Okay, now we've got a different one. Little t, big R. So now we're going to have a big T with a little t. Big T, little t. And you always want to put the dominant gene for, or the dominant allele first whenever you're writing it. Then you've got big R, little r. So this is still going to code for tall and round because you have a dominant allele in, for the tall and a dominant allele for round. Next you're going to have big T, little t, big R, little r. So again, tall and round. Unless we have two recessives, we're going to continue to have tall and round. Okay. Now we've got little t, little t, big R, little r. So now we have two recessive genes. So we're going to have a short plant, but it's still going to be round because we have that big R. Okay, the next one, little t, little t, big R, little r. And so again, we're going to have a short, round pea plant. Okay. 
This is going to be the same way that we did the top row. Since this was a little t big R and this is a little t big R, the results are going to be the same across the board. Big T, little t, big R, little r. And then we get to our little t, little t, big R, little r for these last two because we've got the little t, little t, big R, little r for both of those. And they're going to code the same as the ones above them. Tall and round, tall and round, tall and short. Wait. Sorry. Short and still round. And then short and round. So now we want to do our phenotypic ratio. We want to say how many of them look the same. So we know we have a lot that are tall and round, so let's count and see how many we've got. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we've got 12. The majority of our plants are going to be tall with round peas. And then we have 1, 2, 3, 4 that are short and round. So our ratio would be 12 to 4, our phenotypic ratio that just tells us what the plants look like. Because if we were looking at the, the alleles themselves, some of the tall plants have two dominants for T, and some of them have a dominant and a recessive for T. But either way, they came out tall. So since they look tall, they get counted in the phenotypic ratio. Punnett squares can be kind of fun, and they kind of are like what you would do whenever you're graphing in math. So you just kind of have to make sure that you put every possibility out there. You put every allele along each side and then make sure you fill it in correctly and pay attention to how the alleles are going to code. Do you have two dominants coding for a dominant, a dominant and a recessive coding for a dominant, or do you have those two recessives coding for a recessive gene? You want to look at every possible option so that you can make an accurate prediction with your Punnett square. RNA, or ribonucleic acid, is made up of a base pair connected by sugar molecules and phosphate molecules. Now the bases in RNA are going to be adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine. Similar to DNA, they're going to pair with each other and only each one is only going to pair with one other base. They can't pair with any of the other three. So, adenine pairs with uracil and guanine pairs with cytosine. Guanine and cytosine also pair in DNA. Your curved letters for abbreviation pair together. And adenine and uracil pair together in RNA and it's your vowels that are pairing together. Now in DNA, you have thymine as your other base, the base that pairs with adenine. But in RNA, you've got a different base. So you can think of it as your two abbreviations that are vowels paired together and your two curved abbreviations paired together. So adenine with uracil and guanine with cytosine. Usually, RNA is going to be single-stranded. But it can form a double helix, like the shape of DNA, by folding in on itself. So you have a single strand made up of sugar molecules and phosphate molecules, and then you've got the little base pairs coming off of it. So it may be like this. You've got your sugar and phosphate molecules, and then you've got your little base pairs coming off of it. And my little lines here are splitting it. So you would have adenine and uracil, guanine and cytosine, adenine and uracil, 
guanine cytosine, all the way down. Now, if the RNA was more complex, it may fold in on itself, and this could curve around and kind of form a double helix by being tightly coiled and wrapped together so that instead of having just one side of the ladder, it curved up and made the one side kind of sandwich it together and form into a double helix that way. But it's not going to be the same kind of pattern, the same structure as DNA is going to be. RNA is also a carrier of genetic material in some viruses. So, in viruses, RNA can carry the genetic material, and a lot of times, if it's a more complex virus, you'll have um, RNA that is a double helix. It has formed a more complex structure to carry genetic material for the viruses. In most cells, DNA is what's holding all of the genetic material, but RNA is what kind of moves it around the cell. So let's look at the three main types of RNA. Messenger RNA, or mRNA, carries codes from DNA in the nucleus to ribosomes in the cytoplasm. So it's moving, it's um, being a messenger and carrying that code from the DNA to ribosomes. Ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, they read that code carried by the messenger RNA. And ribosomes are composed of the ribosomal RNA and proteins. So the ribosomal RNA is a big part of ribosomes. And then transfer RNA, or tRNA, bring amino acids to the ribosomes where they are linked to proteins. So you can see RNA is moving around the cell a lot. It's not just staying in one place. DNA is mainly just going to stay in the nucleus and hold that genetic material. RNA is going to move it around, except in the case of viruses, where RNA is the main holder of genetic material instead of just a transport system. So let's, let me show you what this might look like. So let's say we've got our ribosome, and so you've got RNA, your ribosomal RNA in here. Well, you've got DNA in the nucleus over here, and it's going to get transferred to RNA via the messenger RNA. So it's going to send that code along and it's going to come into the ribosomal RNA. And then you've got transfer RNA out here and it's going to bring amino acids into the ribosome. So you've got your ribosome here, and your ribosome holds the RNA. It takes in the mRNA, reads the code from DNA, it takes in the transfer RNA, and picks up these amino acids, and out comes a protein. So the whole point of all this was to create a new protein, and RNA is a big part of protein synthesis. So it's going to move the code from the DNA via messenger RNA into a ribosome, and transfer RNA is going to bring amino acids into the ribosome, and the ribosomal RNA is going to take the code and take the amino acid and create a protein and spit it out. So that's what's going on here. Remember the big differences between RNA and DNA? DNA is holding all that information in the nucleus. RNA is moving the information around. It's how DNA gets its code from one place to another. So RNA is more of a transfer system within the cell, and it, can, it has several different kinds of RNA so that it can do different jobs in the cell, all working on transferring that genetic code. A buffer is a solution of a weak acid and its conjugate base. It is useful for reducing changes in the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution, 
when additional hydrogen ions are removed or added. And so um, that means that it resists changes in pH. So now say um, if, if you were to take a look at this reaction right here. So I talked about a weak acid and its conjugate base. So we have this weak acid and its conjugate base. And so you see here this weak acid dissociates in this reaction. Now this reaction is at equilibrium because it has a double headed arrow, meaning this reaction is moving in both directions. So not only is this weak acid dissociating um, into its principal parts, but um, the parts over here are forming back together to form that weak acid. And so say for example that some of this right here was added. What's going to happen is the reaction is going to shift to the left and more of this weak acid is going to be produced. Now say for example if this was added it would combine with this right here and so it would reduce the overall level of this and so it would shift the reaction to the right. And so notice here that the buffer solution reduces the changes and this right here that, that might occur otherwise. And so some examples of buffer systems include uh, an acetic acid with sodium acetate uh, and another one is citric acid along with sodium cit uh, citrate. And so again a buffer is a solution of a weak acid and its conjugate base that resists changes in pH. Catalysts are substances that speed up the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. And so the way a catalyst works is first by lowering activation energy. and it lowers the activation energy that is required for a chemical reaction to proceed. And so by lowering that activation energy, the chemical reaction can proceed more easily. Now, another way that a catalyst meets its objective is by providing a surface for molecules to come together and to bind. And so to provide a surface for molecules to, to come together to bind is uh, faster than just random collisions of reactant molecules. So that is how a catalyst meets its goal of speeding up the rate of a chemical reaction. Now we can classify catalyst as homogeneous catalyst and heterogeneous catalyst. So a homogeneous catalyst is in the same phase as the reactants. So say you have a liquid reactant and you have a liquid catalyst, then it's a homogeneous catalyst. Now a heterogeneous catalyst is just the opposite of that. The catalyst is in a different phase than the reactants are. So some examples of this would be uh, take liquid bromine, for example, and it speeds up the breakdown of liquid hydrogen peroxide into liquid water and oxygen gas. So you have liquid bromine and you have liquid hydrogen peroxide. So those are in the same phase, so that's a homogeneous catalyst. Now take for example the combination of ethylene and hydrogen gases to make ethane gas. It's catalyzed by adding powdered nickel. So you have powdered nickel which is in solid form and everything else is in gas form or, or, the, or the gas phase. So in that reaction nickel is a heterogeneous catalyst. So an important point to remember is that catalysts are substances that speed up the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. Today we want to go over just some of the basics of chemical reactions. Uh, we don't have time today to do this thoroughly or fully in depth, but just want to go over some of the basics of chemical reactions. So when we think about chemical reactions, one of the things we ought to think about is time scale. How rapidly or slowly do chemical reactions um, 
take place. And in terms of time scale, obviously we're measuring this uh, from our vantage point, from our viewpoint, so on the human time scale, the way we experience time, uh, chemical reactions can happen very rapidly, very quickly, and also very slowly. From the lower end, just fractions of a second for a chemical reaction to take place, all the way up to the upper end, years and years and years and years and years before a chemical reaction fully takes place, and everything in between. So with chemical reactions, the time scale is from fractions of a second all the way up to uh, lots of years for them to take place and everything in between. When we think about time scale, we also think reaction rates. What affects reaction rates? So in a chemical reaction, we need to think in terms of the frequency of the contact between uh, the chemical components that are reacting. If it uh, is very little contact, you have a slower rate. If they don't come into contact very often, that also slows it. If there's a great mixing of these things that react volatilely, you can have a very rapid reaction. So it's the frequency of contact between the interacting chemicals. The temperature plays a role. Higher temperature, lower temperature can affect uh, not only the reaction but the time rate as well. And then the properties of the chemical uh, that is interacting. Is it uh, a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Um, the shape it's in. All of these things play a part in reaction rates. Frequency, temperature, and properties. Then when we think about reaction rates, you can actually influence those rates. You can accelerate a reaction rate. This is called using a catalyst. A catalyst is introduced into that chemical reaction which greatly speeds it up. And that's the catalyst's only job is to come into uh, this interaction between these chemicals and to speed up that reaction that would ordinarily take place over a slower period of time. You rapidly increase it. But you can also decrease reaction rates, and this is called using inhibitors. If you introduce an inhibitor into a chemical reaction, it slows it down. It keeps them from reacting as quickly. So you can affect reaction rates not only um, naturally and through ways that you're able to control temperature and uh, what form it's in, things like this, but you can also introduce other chemicals, catalysts to accelerate and inhibitors to decelerate the reaction times of the chemical reaction. Now, chemical reactions can, when they occur, release heat, release light, electrons, ions. Uh, there's usually some form of um, product from this interaction, this chemical reaction that's taken place. Uh, sometimes chemical reactions uh, send the temperature in the opposite direction, but usually it's things like heat and light, um, electrons being traded or um, spun off, um, ions, you know, radicals going off, things like this. And then finally, um, heat and other factors can influence chemical reactions and help break bonds. If you think in terms of breaking down carbon bonds, uh, this is done obviously in the uh, production of oil and related materials. You've got strong, stable carbon bonds that need to be broken down and split up. Heat is usually a thing that is primarily used to help break those bonds, divide those things up, and then sort them out to their various functions and purposes. And uh, if you ever do any sort of research or study, it's very fascinating to look at uh, an oil or a chemical plant and how they bring in the raw materials using heat and other uh, pressure and things like this to break up the raw material that's brought in into various other materials, um, sift it out and sent other places and put to other uses. It's fascinating. But anyway, chemical reactions then. Just the basic overview again, time scale from fractions of a second to years and years and years. Reaction rates are affected by the frequency of contact, the temperature at the, uh, at the point of their mixing and their contact, and then the properties, uh, solid liquid gas, uh, the shape of it, these sorts of things. Reaction rates can be accelerated with catalysts, decreased with inhibitors. Uh, chemical reactions produce things often like heat, light, um, spinning off electrons, ions, things like this, and heat and other factors influence chemical reactions and help to break bonds. Once again, this has just been the basic overview of chemical reactions. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video, you'll find a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. And while you're at that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Today, I want to go over briefly dehydration. Dehydration causes, signs, uh, best way to test for it, and um, best treatment options in terms of dehydration. Uh, I don't personally wish dehydration on anyone. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but it is not pleasant. Uh, last year, prior to Thanksgiving, I got violently ill and was unable to keep any fluids down of, of any kind. My body stopped taking in fluids. They went in, they immediately came back out. And eventually, because of the lack of intake of fluid, my kidneys shut down 
I ended up in the hospital. Uh, it was very painful, not a pleasant experience. So dehydration is a bad thing. Um, you don't want to experience it. But what we talk about dehydration, we, uh, the main cause is, of course, lack of water intake or excessive loss of water or high solute load. In my case, I had both of those, uh, lack of fluid intake and an excessive loss of fluid because I was sick. And uh, this can be especially dangerous in children um, if they become violently ill and they have vomiting or diarrhea, uh, you can lose a great deal of fluid in a very short amount of time. So anyway, dehydration, lack of water intake, excessive loss of water, uh, it comes about due to sickness, it can come about because someone doesn't drink enough water and then they sweat a great deal, or because of their diet and other things, they have a high level of solute in their blood, a high level of things dissolved in it of uh, various types, and this can cause dehydration as the fluids get all out of balance. Signs that someone has dehydration uh, include fever, sweating, hyperventilation, rapid weight loss, decreased urine output, and in my case last year, zero output. Um, the kidneys just shut down. Poor skin turgor. Uh, skin turgor basically is if you pull up the skin on the back of your hand or behind the arm, you pull it up, tent it up, and let go. If you have good turgor, it goes back to its original place rapidly. If it goes back to its original position slowly, this is poor skin turgor. So dehydration, uh, poor skin turgor tends to be a sign of that. And then increase in the solutes. Uh, things like uh, serum uric acid lab values uh, go up and those sorts of things. Anyway, uh, the best lab assessment for dehydration is to test for uh, serum sodium. Now, normal level is 136 to 145. If it's outside of that, then you have a strong case for dehydration. Uh, the best treatment for dehydration, the best way to rehydrate the body, is to take water orally by mouth or to put a 5% dextrose solution in the water. Um, in my case, my body was unable to process it, and so it had to go in intravenously. But the best way to treat dehydration is drink lots of water. So this has just been a basic overview of dehydration, its causes, its signs, best lab assessment, best treatment. And if you'd like to learn more about this and related matters, underneath this video, you'll find a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. And while you're on that website, you should also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Today, in our video, we want to go over a simple concept in physics called displacement. Uh, physics may sound scary, but it really is just the explanation and description of the way matter moves. The explanation and description of the way matter moves. So when there is a change of a piece of matter, a brick, from one location to another location, we have had what in physics is called displacement, change in location from one place to another of some matter. Um, hitting a golf ball, displacement. It starts on the tee and it ends wherever the shot ends and that movement of the ball starting on the tee and ending up out in the fairway, hopefully, in physics is called displacement. Now when we think about displacement, we can actually uh, write it out and, and uh, describe it mathematically. And this is what makes physics so great. It's a mathematical description of the motion of matter and can be very precise, which is very helpful. So displacement then is the final position of the golf ball on the fairway minus the original position with the ball on the tee. And we often talk about that in terms of, hey, he just drove the ball 280 yards. So that 280 yards is it a description of the displacement of the golf ball 280 yards down the fairway from the beginning point on the tee. The final position minus the original position, 280 yards. And when we talk about it in those terms, just the size of that displacement, the distance traveled, that is a scalar quantity. A scalar is magnitude or size alone. We didn't talk anything about direction. Did it go? 280 yards uh, down the fairway um, straight, or did it hook, or did it slice? Um, did it go 500 feet straight up and then come down? Uh, we didn't talk about direction at all. We just measured the size or the magnitude. So magnitude equals size, or the measurement of the displacement, 280 yards. Now when we add direction to the magnitude or size, 
we get what's called a vector. So the difference between vectors and scalars is the difference between having the magnitude alone or having the magnitude plus the direction. And I've got some examples here on the board that we're going to look at. If I say something was moved five meters to the right, I have both magnitude, the size, in this case the distance moved, five meters, plus the direction to the right. Five meters to the right is a vector because it has both magnitude and direction, both a distance measurement, a size, and the direction in which it went to the right. Now, if I tell you 32 degrees centigrade, all I've given you is the magnitude, the size of it alone. I haven't talked about any sort of direction of that temperature up or down. So that would just be a scalar. 32 degrees centigrade is a scalar. If I talk about um, five meters without giving you any direction, I've given you another scalar. If I talk about 256 megabytes, I've given you a scalar. I haven't given any change in direction, any change um, in in the direction it's gone in the amount lesser or, or uh, more. All I've talked about is here magnitude, the size. Now if I say we traveled five miles north, I've just given you a vector. Magnitude, the measurement here, the size, five miles, and direction, north. And so when we think in terms of the golf ball, if I just said he drove it 285 yards, I've given you a scalar. But if I said he drove it 285 yards straight down the fairway, I've just given you a direction as well and a vector. Displacement, once again, is the main thing to take away from this video. That is the uh, movement, uh, the change in location from one place to another of matter. So the change from one location to another is called displacement. Think of a golf ball. Think of picking up and moving a box. Uh, matter moving from one place to another, and displacement can be described, once again, it equals the final position minus the original position. Within displacement, we can talk about scalars and vectors, the difference between them being that vectors also include direction, whereas scalars only have magnitude. All right, well, that's just been a basic overview, and I do mean basic, of the uh, very elementary concepts in physics related to displacement. And if you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, if you'll look underneath this video, there's a link down there. If you click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. And while you're on that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Friction. Friction is the force that results as a resistance to motion where two surfaces are in contact. So if two surfaces are touching, there's going to be friction between them. If I'm holding my hands together, there's friction between them if I rub them. If I'm holding this remote, there's friction between my hand and the remote as I try to slide it across. So friction is just that force that results when you try to move two things uh, against each other whenever two surfaces are touching. Now friction can be calculated using this formula. And in this formula, this lowercase f represents friction, what you're calculating. The uppercase f with a little c is the contact force. So the c stands for contact, the big F. It's always going to stand for force. So the contact force between the two objects. So just their basic resting force right here. Me holding this remote on my hand. There's a force between them. There's a force against my hand by the remote. There's a force against the remote by my hand. They're pushing against each other as they are sitting here. So the contact force is right here. The Weird looking little u is a symbol that represents the coefficient of friction based on the material's compositions. So what each one is made of. So there is going to be a specific coefficient between skin and plastic. And multiplying the contact force of these two objects by the coefficient of force between or the coefficient of friction between plastic and skin, you would be able to get the friction that would result between these two items. There are several different kinds of friction. We're going to talk about two kinds that exist between dry friction. Now there will be friction between different liquids. Uh, two surfaces don't necessarily mean two solid surfaces, but we're just going to talk about dry friction today. 
So static friction is one type of friction that can result with dry friction. And it exists when a small amount of force is exerted, but neither object actually moves. So if I were to push on this remote, I'm applying a force right now, but the remote is not actually moving. So this is a static force because I'm pushing. I can feel the pressure on my hand where the remote's trying to move, but I'm not putting enough force that it actually moves. So this is a static friction right now. The other type of dry friction is kinetic friction. And this exists when a larger amount of force is exerted and one of the objects does move. So if I push the remote hard enough that it actually moves on my hand, this is kinetic friction. It's actually moving on my hand. If I'm pushing and it's not moving, static friction. If I'm pushing and it moves, kinetic friction. Static, no movement, not pushing hard enough, apply a larger force and it actually slides along my hand, kinetic friction. So the friction of staying still but applying force is static. The friction of two objects actually moving against each other is kinetic. Now generally, static friction will be greater than kinetic friction, even though you may think, oh, well, if you're actually moving the object, it's going to be more. That's not true, because the amount of force needed to keep an object moving is actually, usually, less than the force needed to get it started. So it actually took a bit more force to get this started moving then it does to keep it moving. So once I get the remote moving, it's not using as much force, and so my static friction was actually going to be greater than my kinetic friction. So while I'm pushing here trying to get it to go, there's more friction than whenever I've actually got it moving. So once I've gotten it moving, it's easier to keep it moving than it was to get it started, which is what that means whenever we say the static friction is going to be greater than the kinetic friction which means the force pushing on an object where you don't get it to move yet is going to be larger than the friction whenever you're pushing on the object and you do get it to start moving. So friction is just that force that exists between two objects that are touching whenever you try to move them. Any two objects that are touching, if you try to move them against each other, you will kind of feel that force and that is known as friction. MCAT organic chemistry. A functional group is an atom or a group of atoms which defines the function or the mode of activity of a given carbon compound. And so again, a functional group is an atom or a group of atoms which is defining the function or the mode of activity of a given carbon compound. So here we have the name of a functional group, its structure, and then the corresponding class of compounds that it's in. So hydroxyl is one type of functional group with this structure and, um, and its corresponding class of compounds is the alcohols. Then we have carbonyl with this structure which um, goes along with ketones. Then we have carboxyl with this structure which is in the carboxylic acids. And then amino with this setup right here which is its corresponding class of compounds is the amines. And so this um, is all, these are all groups of atoms that are defining the function or the mode of activity of a given carbon compound. The hydrologic cycle. The hydrologic or water cycle refers to water movement on, above, and within the earth. Now, during the water cycle or hydrologic cycle. Water can be in any one of its three states during different phases of the cycle. So during all the different phases of the cycle, water is going to be in the form of liquid water, solid ice or snow, and water vapor. 
which is water's gas form. So you've got solid, liquid, and gas, and all three states of water can be found in different phases of the hydrologic cycle. So let's look at all the different processes that can be involved in the hydrologic cycle. Precipitation is when water vapor falls to the earth as rain, snow, sleet, or hail. But it's coming from the atmosphere down to the earth. So when water is falling from the atmosphere to the earth, that is precipitation. So rain is the most common form you'll see, but if it's colder, you can have snow, sleet, or hail. Next, when precipitation lands on plant foliage instead of the ground. So water's falling, but there's so much foliage that the water's going to fall on the plants instead of the ground. This is known as canopy interception. So the canopy, which would be the top of the foliage layer, is intercepting the water. Runoff produced by melting snow is known as snow melt. So if you have big drifts of snow and they start to melt, the water is going to run off downhill and um, join any lakes, streams, or rivers nearby. So sometimes when snow starts to melt in the spring, there will be flooding because rivers that weren't used to having so much water are going to have all this excess water from snow melt. Next, when water flows from the surface into the ground, that is known as infiltration. So the water is infiltrating the ground. Water that flows underground. So once the water is infiltrated and is flowing underground in your groundwater, that is called subsurface flow or below the surface. When liquid water changes to a gas, that is evaporation. When solid water, such as snow or ice, changes to a gas without going through the liquid phase, so it goes straight from ice or snow to water vapor, then that is known as sublimation. Think about if you dropped an ice cube into a skillet that's been on the stove and is really hot. You're going to see a lot of steam come up. The ice didn't turn to liquid first, it went straight to steam because there was such a drastic temperature change. And that is a process known as sublimation. The movement of water through the atmosphere is known as advection. When water vapor changes to liquid water, that's known as condensation. If there's water vapor in the air and it condenses into liquid water, that is the process of condensation. When water vapor is released from plants into the air, that is known as transpiration. So sometimes water falls on the plants, the plants take it in, and they also take in water through their roots from the ground, and whenever they release water through their leaves, that is known as transpiration. So let's look at a picture and kind of look at an example of each of these. The most common things you're going to see in your water cycle are, let's just say we've got water. So this is your liquid water and let's say we've got some land on the side of this river and so we've got our liquid water but we've also got ground water underneath our land and so you've got your water just standing on the ground. From there, water will evaporate and go through the atmosphere. When it goes through the atmosphere, you've got advection as it is evaporating. So you've got advection as it's moving through the atmosphere and evaporating as it's changing from water to gas or water vapor. And once it gets up into the air, it's going to keep going and condense. And when the water vapor that's in the air condenses onto tiny particles, it forms clouds. 
So that is your condensation. When you form these clouds, that is water vapor condensing onto tiny particles in the air and kind of joining together. When the clouds get heavy enough, they're going to release that water. And it's going to have advection because you're going to be um, having water move through the atmosphere again. But it's going to be falling, falling as precipitation. So the most common things you're going to see are evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. But let's look at the other ones too. So you've got rain falling down, and some of it's going to fall under the water. That's fine. If it falls onto the ground, then we're going to have infiltration. And whenever we've got this groundwater, there's going to be subsurface flow. So let's see what we're missing. We've got our precipitation falling down, canopy in interception. Okay, we've got our rain falling over here, and we've got some little flowers, and we've got some big trees, and when the rain falls on this tree, we have canopy interception. The water is being intercepted by the canopy of the tree. Snow melt? Okay, let's go this way with it. Let's say we've got kind of a hill going on here and you've got some mounds of snow and it's going to start melting and coming down the hill and draining in here. This is going to be your snow melt and this is the runoff from that snow melt. We discussed infiltration, subsurface flow in your groundwater, evaporation, sublimation, when solid water is going to change to gas without going through a liquid phase. You may see some of that here if it gets warm enough and the snow just directly evaporates into the air without actually melting into the liquid form. Some of it may just evaporate into the air. So any that is coming up off the snow, that would be sublimation. We got evaporation. Advection, we talked about, if it's moving through the atmosphere, that's your advection. And condensation, we've got falling to the earth, and transpiration. Then when these plants give off water into the atmosphere, you have transpiration. So that covers all of the different processes that could be involved in the hydrologic cycle. There are lots of them. The most important ones you want to remember are evaporation, condensation, and precipitation because they're the ones you're going to see most often. But every other one of these processes is involved in the hydrologic cycle, which is basically just explaining all the different ways that water can move in, on, and above the Earth's surface. The brain is one of the most important parts of our nervous system and today we're going to go over the various parts of the brain and talk about some of the ways they contribute and help in the areas over which that part of our brain control. And so we're going to begin then with the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe controls our emotions, our judgments, and our motor aspects of our speech and is also the primary motor cortex for voluntary muscle activation. Uh, after the frontal lobe we have the parietal lobe which receives sensory information from touch uh, proprioception which has to do with our um, ability to tell where our arms and legs are and our orientation in space so even with your eyes closed you know where your arms and legs are you have a sense of your body this is proprioception uh, the parietal lobe helps govern that also our sensation of temperature and pain um, that's the parietal lobe then the temporal lobe is responsible for our hearing, auditory information, and our language comprehension. The occipital lobe is our center for visual information, our sight. Uh, the cerebellum coordinates all of our muscle function. And then we have the brain stem. And within the brain stem, we've got the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Uh, the brain stem is, um, governs our breathing, our respiration, our uh, hearts, our cardiac center, and uh, all the nerve pathways to the brain come through the brain stem. And then finally, uh, moving on then from that to the 
uh, diencephalon, which is the thalamus, subthalamus, and hypothalamus. Uh, the thalamus helps integrate and relay sensory information from the face, our feelings there, our retinas, our cochlea from our ears, our taste receptors, and interprets sense, uh, sensation of touch, pain, and temperature. So our thalamus is very important to not only um, our sense of what we feel in terms of pain, temperature, touch, uh, but also our retinas, our eyes, our cochlea, and our ears, and our taste and our tongue. The hypothalamus controls the autonomic nervous system and the neuroendocrine system. It maintains our body homeostasis, helps regulate body temperature, uh, helps regulate our appetites, um, governs our thirst and how we feel that, our sleeping cycle, and hormone secretions. So once again, the brain, a uh, very um, integral, necessary, core part of our nervous system, broken up into these various regions and what they controlled. If you'd like to find out more about the brain and its relation to our nervous system, I encourage you to go to the link that you'll find below this video. Uh, at that website, you'll find a ebook that is uh, ready for immediate download. Most noble gases do not react with other elements. And so when we talk about noble gases, these come from the six elements in group 18, which is in the 18th column of the periodic table all the way to the right. And so these noble gases don't react with other elements, mainly because they have a full octet of valence electrons. And so these noble gases already have eight valence electrons, so they don't need to engage in chemical reactions to gain more valence electrons, so they don't have a need to. However, under some extreme conditions, some noble gases can be made to react chemically. Now, xenon, which is a larger, heavier noble gas, is more likely to enter into a chemical reaction because its ionization energy is going to be lower than those of lighter, smaller noble gases like neon. And so an ionization energy is the amount of energy that it takes to remove an, remove an electron from an atom or molecule. And so xenon has a, low, a relatively low ionization energy, so it's not going to take a lot of energy for a reaction with it to take place. And so, like I said, the larger, heavier noble gases are the best candidates for engaging in chemical reactions. Now, xenon can react with fluorine to produce xenon fluorides. So that's one example of noble gas compounds. And then xenon can also, uh, or xenon fluorides rather, can react with water and they can produce oxygen containing xenon oxyfluorides. So, they can produce xenon oxyfluorides as well as xenon oxides. So that's a look at the reasons noble gases do not react with other elements and how it occurs when they do react with other elements. Potential and kinetic energy. Potential energy is the amount of energy an object has stored due to its position or orientation. So potential energy is how much energy an object has when it's sitting still. It's just stored. It is not in motion. It's how much energy an object could have if it moved. It's potential energy and gravity most commonly affects potential energy. Now there are other factors such as mass that can affect potential energy, but the force of gravity on an object is going to affect it the most. So if an object is up higher, it's going to have more potential energy than an object that's down lower because the lower object is going to have um, a smaller amount of space to fall. The higher object is going to have a further way to fall and so it's going to have more potential energy. 
the formula for finding potential energy, PE stands for potential energy, equals MGH. M stands for mass. G stands for acceleration of gravity. So the force that gravity is going to have on that object. And H stands for height. So you'll multiply the mass of the object times the acceleration of gravity times the height from which it is from the ground. And that is going to give you your potential energy. So you can see that the acceleration of gravity and the height, the distance an object is from the ground, are both big parts in this formula for finding potential energy. So gravity is very important to the potential energy in an object. So potential energy is how much energy an object has stored while it's sitting still. Kinetic energy is the energy of an object in motion. So when an object is actually moving, that is whenever you're seeing kinetic energy. And kinetic energy, Ke, can be found with this formula, mv squared divided by 2, where m equals the mass and v equals velocity. So mass times the velocity squared divided by 2 will give you the kinetic energy of an object. So this one doesn't have as much to do with gravity because once it's in motion, the kinetic energy has more to do with the velocity and the mass of the object. So let's look at this. So we've got this little situation set up. You built this out of wood or Legos or something and you've got a ball and you're going to roll it down here. So when your ball is here, you have potential energy. It's sitting still. Once it goes over the edge, and you have it here, you have kinetic energy because this ball is in motion. If it moves down some more and sits still for a minute, you're going to have potential energy as it's sitting still because it could still go down some more. And if it does, then you have kinetic energy again because this ball is rolling. It's in motion. And then if it lands here, you've got potential energy again because it can still drop off this ledge. So potential energy is energy that's stored while an object is still. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. It's while something is actually moving. So potential is still and stored. Kinetic is moving in motion. When we think about our pulse, it's something that many of us take for granted. We know we have one, we're alive, uh, but we don't think about it much. And so we're going to go over a few things related to pulse today. And by answering a few questions, what is a pulse? Basically, when the left ventricular pumps blood into the arteries, their elasticity causes them to expand as they receive the oxygenated blood. And this expansion then is called pulse. The pulse should be rhythmic and known to be such, uh, felt to be such, seen to be such. What is a normal pulse? Well, the average normal pulse is between 70 to 80 beats per minute. Now, there are things that can affect normal pulse. Uh, the average person has between 70 to 80 beats per minute, but beta blockers can uh, affect a pulse. Someone with hypertension is going to have a higher pulse rate. Those with hypotension or those who are in very good physical health can have a lower heart rate. Some of them as low as 60 beats per minute can be common if they're exceptionally fit. A resting heart rate of 60 beats per minute. So we know what a pulse is as the left ventricular uh, contracts and pushes blood out to the arteries. The arteries expand and it's this expansion. As they receive the blood, it's called the pulse as the heart keeps pumping the blood. Um, we know what a normal pulse is. Now where would you find the pulse? Uh, there are many places uh, to check for a pulse, but the best place to look and sense a pulse is where an artery lies on top of a bone so that you can then press on the artery over the bone and feel the blood as it's pumped by there. Um, basically, uh, the palpitation of an artery uh, over a bone is the best place to check, and the pulse is strongest and easiest to, easiest to detect in the arteries that are closest to the heart where the blood's coming out. Common pulse checkpoints then, 
We think, first of all, very commonly, of the wrist. When taking a pulse, you need to use your index finger and middle finger, place it on the artery, over the bone, and apply light pressure. You certainly don't want to apply so much pressure that you're actually stopping the blood flow, but light pressure there to feel for it. Never use your thumb to do this because your own pulse rate in your thumb will interfere with feeling the pulse rate of the person you're trying to determine uh, whether or not they have a pulse and at what rate their uh, pulse rate is. So at the wrist on the radial artery is a common place where these fingers are placed and felt uh, over the wrist bone. At the medial inside of the biceps on the brachial artery is a place that can be checked. And then one that we see a lot in TV and movies, of course, is on the neck, just outside the larynx at the common carotid artery. So again, the two fingers press there uh, with pressure enough to feel the pulse, but not so much that you're cutting off blood supply. Uh, then the way you determine someone's pulse rate is you don't have to feel it for a full 60 seconds. You basically hold your fingers there over the artery, counting their pulse for about 15 seconds, and then you multiply by four, and this will give you their average pulse rate. So we've answered the question of what pulse is, what a normal pulse rate is, where and how you determine pulse, uh, these common places of wrist, bicep, and neck, and then how long you need to actually feel someone's pulse in order to get their uh, beats per minute. If this is something you'd like to learn more about, then please click on the link underneath this video. It'll take you to a website where you can get more information, and on that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Absolute zero is the temperature of zero degrees Kelvin. But I first want to look at how we get to that temperature. All right, so kinetic energy of a gas, of gas molecules causes motion and is measured by temperature. And when gas is cool, the kinetic energy of the gas molecules decrease, hence the temperature decreases. So let's go back up here. All right, so the kinetic energy of gas molecules causes motion. So it's the kinetic energy that makes things move, and this is measured by temperature. So it's not the temperature of something that causes something else. It's when gas molecules are in motion, we measure that amount of motion by temperature. Now, think about gas as cooling. Now, don't think about it in terms of temperature. Don't think about it in terms of degrees. Just think about gas as cooling. You're losing heat. So when gas is cool, the kinetic energy of the gas molecules decreases as well. Now, what did we just learn about the kinetic energy of gas molecules? They cause motion. So if the kinetic energy of the gas molecules are decreasing, then the motion is decreasing as well. And then because of that, temperature decreases because the motion is measured by temperature. So if you think about molecules moving around and you can decrease the amount of motion they have, well, eventually, doesn't it make sense that at some point the molecules wouldn't be moving at all? Well, if the amount of motion of molecules is measured by temperature and the molecules aren't moving at all, then what would the temperature be? It would be zero degrees. So that's how we get to absolute zero. Absolute zero is when the kinetic energy of a molecule is zero. And because the kinetic energy is zero, then molecular motion stops. And we measure molecular motion in temperature. So when molecular motion stops, we measure it in absolute zero which is equal to zero degrees Kelvin, K stands for Kelvin, or negative 273 degrees Celsius. Now, I didn't use Fahrenheit here because in science, we don't use Fahrenheit very often because that's not as important. So here we just have it in Kelvin or in Celsius. So zero degrees Kelvin or negative 273 degrees Celsius is absolute zero. And when that's when kinetic energy of the molecules is zero, and therefore molecular motion stops. Now, nothing can be colder than absolute zero because temperature is a measure of motion. And all motion ceases at absolute zero. So because the motion has all ceased and stopped, the motion can't stop anymore. So that's why absolute zero is absolute because you cannot get any colder than that. Amino acids consist of a central carbon atom bound to four groups. Now, in every amino acid, three of those groups are always going to be the same. They're going to be made up of hydrogen, amine, and a carboxylic acid. 
So it's the fourth group that is going to differ in the 20 naturally occurring amino acids. And so this fourth group could also be called the designated R. And so R basically just stands for any type of chemical chain. And so I'm just going to write here, it differs. Because like I said, although three of the groups are going to be the same for every amino acid, the fourth group is going to differ from amino acid to amino acid. So we can classify amino acids into five different groups. And so we're going to take a look at those classifications. So the first is nonpolar, which is where the R's are mostly alkyl groups. And so that's like alanine, valine, and leucine. And then we have the polar group, which is where the R's are oxygen and hydrogen and a double bond between carbon and hydrogen, but they are not charged. So that would be something like serine, glutamine, or praline. And then we come to the aromatic amino acids, which is where the R's are rings. And so this is phenylalanine, tyrosine, those are some examples. And then another group is what we, would, what we would call positively charged, or we could also call this basic. And by basic, I don't mean simple. I mean the opposite of acidic. And so here the R's are amino groups like lysine and arginine. And then last but not least, the fifth group is basically the opposite of this. So it's negatively charged. Or we could call it the acidic group. So here the R's are carboxyl groups. And so an example of that is aspartate. So that's a look at the five different classifications of amino acids. Astronomy. Astronomy comes from the Greek words astro and nomos, which means, or roughly translates to, laws of the stars. Those are some fitting root words for the word astronomy, because astronomy actually is the scientific study of celestial objects and their positions, where they are located in space, their movements, and their structures. What are these objects actually made of? What are their movements? Uh, astronomers track the movements of all sorts of things that are out in space, and that helps them be able to predict if they're going to be back in the future, or um, look for any other kinds of patterns that may be helpful out there. Now, celestial does not refer to Earth in, in particular. Celestial is referring to the heavens. And by heavens, we mean the sky, space, and all that's contained there. So when you hear celestial, it isn't meaning something specifically to do with earth or the sky right above earth. It's having to do with anything up above earth and beyond. The sky, space, everything going out, out, and out. Now astronomy does include the movement of earth or the motion of earth as it moves through space. Since astronomy studies the positions, movements, and structures, well, Earth is going to be the thing that we know the most about as far as the structure, what it's made of, because it's where we live. And we track its movement and we track its position in space relative to the other things that we can see. Now, there are other objects monitored in astronomy because there are other objects out in space. Other objects monitored in astronomy includes moons, other planets, the sun, satellites, asteroids, meteors, comets, stars, galaxies, the universe, and other space phenomena. So we don't know everything that's out there. We know about the other planets in our solar system. We know about comets that come by um, every so many years that we can expect to see again because we're tracking their movement. We know about satellites that different countries have put into orbit around the Earth. We know that asteroids and meteors come toward the Earth at different times, and we watch for those and make sure we track progress of any large ones so they don't hit the Earth. 
We know about our moon and the sun. We know that other planets have different moons that orbit them, some of them anyway. We know that there are stars out there, and we have many of them named. Um, there are some that you can recognize by sight, the ones in Orion, the North Star. Uh, galaxies. We know that we live in the Milky Way galaxy, but that there are other galaxies and the universe as a whole, and then other space phenomena that we don't even know about. So astronomy has labeled a lot of things. It's tracked lots of positions, movement, and structures of different items, but it doesn't know everything. And it's going to keep us, uh, astronomers are going to keep looking for more laws of the stars. They're going to keep looking to see what else they can find out there, what other space phenomena. But no matter what, astronomy is going to be the scientific study of any objects in space as well as their positions, movements, and structures throughout the celestial heavens. The functions of plant and animal cells vary greatly, and the functions of different cells within a single organism can also be vastly different. So we're going to take a look at plant and animal cells and the similarities and differences between them. And so first let's take a look at the similarities. Plant and animal cells are both eukaryotic. So they're both eukaryotic as opposed to being prokaryotic. And since they're eukaryotic, they both have a nucleus. And then a third important similarity is their reproduction process. Both plant and animal cells reproduce by duplicating genetic material, separating it, and then dividing it in half. There are also some other similarities related to parts of the cells. They both have cell membranes, cytoplasm, microtubules as part, of their, as part of their cytoskeleton, vacuoles, and then many other structures are the same. Now they both have differences with each other. And so we have plant cells and animal cells. And so one huge difference is that plant cells have a cell wall. Animal cells have no cell wall. And so plant cells have a cell wall made of cellulose that can handle high levels of pressure within the cell, which can occur when liquid enters a plant cell. Now plant cells have chloroplast. And these chloroplasts come in handy in a process known as photosynthesis. So plant cells have chloroplasts that are used during the process of photosynthesis, which is the conversion of sunlight into food. Chloroplasts and plants that perform photosynthesis absorb sunlight and then convert that into energy. Now animal cells use something known as mitochondria. And so the mitochondria produce energy from food in animal cells. Another difference is that plant cells have a regular shape. In other words, they pretty much always have the same shape, while animal cells have many shapes. There are many possible shapes that an animal cell could have. And there's also a difference in size. Plant cells are larger than animal cells generally. And then finally, uh, plant cells have cell plates, and so two cells are separated by cell plates, while animal cells pinch in half. So what that means is, is that plant cells build a cell plate between two new cells, while animal cells make a cleavage furrow and pinch in half. So that's not all the differences between these two types of cells, but these are many of the main differences, and these are many of the main similarities. When carbohydrates burn, they yield carbon and water. And so that's why the name carbohydrates comes from carbon and water. Now, carbohydrates include sugars 
and starches. And so sugars and starches are the main source of energy that your body uses. So you can see that carbohydrates are very important. Now there's three basic types of carbohydrates I want to go over. First being monosaccharides. It's a really long word, has compli a complicated spelling with two C's in a row. But more important than the spelling is what a monosaccharide is. So it's a simple sugar such as glucose, fructose, and ribose. Now we call these sugars monomers because these sugars are monomers for more complex ones. And so notice here in monosaccharides we have the prefix mono, which means one. And then I just mentioned that these are monomers, which has that prefix again of mono meaning one. Now you may be familiar with polymers, which has the prefix of poly, which means more than one. So basically these sugars are monomers for more complex molecules. So these are single molecules that are the building blocks to be able to join together with other molecules to form polymers. So remember that because we're going to talk about that more in a little bit. So the second type of carbohydrate is a disaccharide, which is a double sugar such as sucrose, maltose, and lactose. Now sucrose is what we would call table sugar. So it's the type of sugar you use for everyday use, for baking, coffee, that sort of thing. Now the third type of carbohydrate is starches, which are large biological polymers that consist of straight or branched chains of monosaccharides linked together. So let's go ahead and break that down because that's kind of complicated. So these are large biological polymers. So we see that prefix of more than one. And remember, I talked about these being monomers. They're going to join together to form the polymers. And so we see that played out right here because these monomers join together to form polymers. And we even see that confirmed or spoken of again later in this definition. These polymers consist of straight or branch chains of monosaccharides linked together. So starches are basically made up of monosaccharides linked together either in straight or branch chains. Now in complex sugars the monosaccharide monomers combine by condensation reactions where water is removed in the form of a hydrogen atom from one monosaccharide and a hydroxyl group from an adjacent monosaccharide. So that's a look at the three types of carbohydrates. We are going to take a look at the process of charging by conduction. Now it is similar to charging by induction except in this case the material transferring the charge actually touches the material receiving the charge. So what happens is a negatively or positively charged object is touched to an object with a neutral charge. So here we have a sphere and this sphere has a neutral charge so it has the same amount of electrons as protons, the same amount of negative charges as positive charges. Now an object comes in, this square looking object right here, and it has an excess of electrons. So it has an excess negative charge. Now upon touching the sphere, some of these excess electrons move into the sphere. So now what happens is the sphere takes on a negative charge. Before it was neutral, but now it's negative because it has more electrons than protons. Now some of these excess electrons moved into the sphere, so now there's not as many excess electrons over here. Now this object still has a negative charge because it didn't get rid of all the excess but it got rid of some. So what happened here is the electrons moved into the sphere. Now over here we have a similar, um, a similar process going on but this time the object coming in and touching the sphere has an excess positive charge. Now the reason it has an excess positive charge is not because it has excess protons it's because it's missing electrons and so conduction centers around the moving around of electrons not protons. So what happens here as the object touches the sphere the extra protons don't move into the sphere what happens here is that electrons move into the object so electrons move from the sphere to the object. So now what happens here is that the sphere takes on a positive charge because now that it's missing protons it has excuse me, now that it's missing electrons, it has a positive charge. And now this object over here that touched the sphere no longer has a, as, um, a, such a strong positive charge because the electrons going into it balance it out somewhat. So now notice what happened here. We had a negatively charged object touch the sphere and that gave the sphere a negative charge. 
then we had a positively charged object touch the sphere and that gave it a positive charge. So whatever the charge of the object touching the neutral object, that's what the, the charge of the neutral object is going to take on. Okay? And so what's happening here, as I said earlier, electrons are just flowing into or out of the neutral object and then making that neutral object charged. Now insulators cannot be used to conduct charges. Charging by conduction can also be called charging by contact. Now one last thing, the, the law of conservation of charge states that the total number of units before and after charging process remains the same. So again, no electrons here have been created or destroyed. They've just been moved around. Now there's another term called grounding, and that's the removal of a charge on an object by conduction. In induction, a neutral conductive material, such as a sphere, can become charged by a positively or negatively charged object, such as a rod. So here we have our sphere, which has a neutral charge right now, so it has the same amount of electrons and protons. And then here we have a rod. So we're going to say that this rod has a positive charge. So I'm going to put some plus signs here showing it has a positive charge. So at first there's not really an activity, but once this rod is brought closely to the sphere, notice it doesn't touch the sphere, but it gets very close. So what's going to happen is all the electrons are going to come over here to this side of the sphere because they're attracted to the rod. And then you'll have the positive charges over here. Now about this time, a ground touches the sphere. So basically this, is, this could be someone's finger touching the sphere, and then they're touching the ground, so they're connected to the ground. So I'm just going to write here that the ground touches it instead of trying to draw someone's finger. So as soon as this outside source actually touches the sphere, electrons are going to flow into the sphere. So what's happening here is that all the electrons that are already in the sphere are attracted to this rod, so the electrons that are in the person's finger are also going to travel into the sphere because they also want to come over here and be near the rod. Now say we had a similar scenario, we have a sphere again in a rod, but this time it has a negative charge. So what's going to happen is the positive charges are going to be over here because they're attracted to the rod. And then all the negative charges are going to be over here because like charges repel each other. So we have negative charges here, negative charges here. So these negative charges want to get as far, as, way, as far away as possible. So now we have a ground touching the sphere, and so these electrons are going to travel into the ground. They're going to travel to this outside source so they can get even farther away from this negatively charged rod. So notice here what happened is more electrons went in. So now there's more electrons than protons. So now the sphere has a negative charge because electrons have a negative charge. Now over here, electrons moved out. So now there's less negative charges. So there's more positive charges, which gives this a positive charge. So what you can notice here, when you charge by induction, this, the, the sphere is going to end up with a charge opposite of that of the outside source. So here, a positive charge came in, but the sphere ended up being negative. And here we had a positive, uh, excuse me, a negative rod, but the sphere ended up with a positive charge. And so the charge is always going to be opposite that of the charging rod. We're going to take a look at three different terms you're going to come across when discussing circuits. So the first is electric potential, which is an expression of potential energy per unit of charge. And so we basically have two types of energy, potential and kinetic. So potential energy is stored up energy, and kinetic energy is energy in motion. So this is electric potential. So it's electric energy that is stored up that can be used. Now electric potential, or what we could also call electrostatic potential, or voltage, is measured in volts as a scalar quantity. And so the formula is V equals E over Q. So V, of course, stands for voltage, E stands for the electrical potential energy, and Q stands for the charge. Next we have voltage, which is electric potential difference between two points in a circuit. 
So it's the electric potential difference between two points in a circuit. Now voltage can also be thought of as a measure of the rate at which energy is drawn from a source in order to produce a flow of electric charge. And so the rate of flow of electric charge is expressed using the amp. And it can be measured using an ammeter. So one amp is equal to one coulomb, or what we could abbreviate as capital C. It's equal to one coulomb of charge passing through a given area in a second. So one coulomb charge passing through a given area in a second. And then we have electric charge, which typically only moves from areas of high electric potential to areas of low electric potential. So we have electric charge, which moves from high electric potential to low electric potential. Now, to get charges to flow into a high potential area, you must connect it to an area of higher potential by introducing a battery or other voltage source. So say you have an object right here which has, or this is an area of low potential energy, excuse me, of low electric charge. And then over here you have another area that says high electric charge. So naturally electric charge is going to want to move from this area of high electric potential to this area of low electric potential. Now if you want to get this electric charge to move in this direction, that's when you're going to have to introduce a battery or other voltage source. And that's the only way you're going to be able to get this low electric potential, uh, or the only way you're going to be able to move this electric charge from this area of low electric potential to this area of high electric potential. So that's a brief look at electric potential, voltage, and electric charge. Certain molecules are called diatomic molecules, and these are made up of two atoms of the same element that are bound together by covalent bonds. Now, you may have heard of covalent bonds made up of atoms of different elements, but diatomic molecules are strictly made up of atoms of the same element combining together to form covalent bonds. And by sharing one or more valence electrons through that covalent bond, the atoms can then fill their outer shells. For example, the hydrogen molecule, which looks like this, is a diatomic molecule. And by sharing an electron, each hydrogen atom can fill its outer shell, and the molecule then has one covalent bond. And so an hydrogen atom may look something like this, and then there's two hydrogen atoms in a hydrogen molecule. And so since each hydrogen atom needs one valence electron, or an, another valence electron to fill its outer shell, the two hydrogen atoms combine forces to share their valence electron with one another, and since a covalent bond is one pair of shared valence electrons, they form a covalent bond right there. Now, there can be more than one covalent bond in a diatomic molecule. An oxygen molecule is formed when two oxygen atoms share two pairs of valence electrons between them. And nitrogen, which looks like that, is formed when two nitrogen atoms share three pairs of valence electrons. So here you have two pairs, and here you have three pairs. So although um, a hydrogen molecule is a very simple illustra illustration of a diatomic molecule, there can also be two pairs or even three pairs of valence electrons between them. And many gases are diatomic molecules, such as oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. An electric charge is either positive or negative. So in science, we have the electron and the proton. The electron is negative, so I'm going to abbreviate, you, abbreviate it using a negative sign or a subtraction sign. So that's going to stand for negative. Some people would also write it like this. We also have the proton, which has a positive charge, which I'm going to abbreviate using the addition sign. That means positive. This also means positive if I write it like that. So the interaction between electrons and protons is very interesting. 
if I have two electrons, so that's an electron right there, has the negative sign, then I have another electron right here. These two electrons do not want to be near each other. In fact, they want to repel each other away. So I'm going to draw this double arrow right here, um, signifying that the two electrons are going to push away from each other. This is also the case if you have two protons. The protons do not want to get near each other. So those are the two protons pushing away from each other. Now if you have a proton over here with a positive charge and an electron over here with a negative charge, they're going to join together to form an atom because they're attracted to each other and they want to become one. Now, it's interesting to note that large objects do not have electric charges. So like this whiteboard, for example, it's not positive or negative, but it's made up of atoms, and the atoms contain protons and electrons, which have positive and negative charges. Well, the reason this whiteboard has no electric charge is because the electrons are negative and the protons are positive, and they cancel each other out. The electric forces cancel each other out, okay? Because in an atom, you have an equal number of electrons and protons. So in an atom, say you have five electrons, you will have five protons. You have five negative charges and you have five positive charges. So those charges cancel each other out, giving the atom no charge. And since this whiteboard is made up of atoms with no charge, the whiteboard has no charge. Now, if you have more electrons in a substance than protons, it's going to have a negative charge. If you have more protons than electrons in a substance, it's going to have a positive charge. Now, I want to elaborate a little bit more on what I talked about right here. When you have a proton and an electron, say they're that far apart, the force right here is going to be a lot smaller than if the proton's right here and the electron's right here. When the proton and electron are very close to each other, the force between them is very large. The attractive force that's bringing them together is very large, a lot bigger than the electric charge up here. One last point is that when a, um, a substance or an atom when an atom has less electrons than protons, it's called an ion. It's also called an ion when it has more electrons than protons. Either way, it's called an ion because there's an imbalance of protons and electrons. Electric force is the attractive force between the electrons and the nucleus. Now a positive charge or a negative charge creates a field in the empty space around it and we call that empty space an electric field. So say you have a positive charge right here it's going to have an electric field around it and so the area around it is going to be impacted by that positive charge. It works the same way for a negative charge. You also have an electric field around it. Now, like charges repel each other and opposite charges attract. So say you had a positive charge here and a positive charge here, they're going to repel each other because they are like charges. Then also if you had two negative charges, they are like charges, so they're going to repel each other. But then say you had a positive charge over here and a negative charge over here, they're going to attract each other, so they're going to be attracted to one another because they're opposite charges and opposite charges attract. Now we have lines of force which show the path of charges. So say you had a positive charge right here, you would have lines of force coming off of it. Now all the lines are going to have arrows on them. So the direction of a positive charge is away from it and the direction of a negative charge is towards it. So all these arrows right here would point away from the positive charge but if we had a negative charge, then all the arrows would point towards it. And then notice here that I drew the arrows on the end of the line, but sometimes the lines will be longer and the arrows will look kind of like that and they'll just be in the middle of the line. It works the same way with negative charges. So these arrows are going to point towards the negative charge. Now electric charge is measured with the unit coulomb and so it is spelled like this C-O-U-L-O-M-B and we can abbreviate it just with a capital C like that. So one coulomb 
is equal to what we could say is 1a times 1s. And so a here stands for amp and s stands for second. So it's the amount of charge moved in one second by a steady current of one amp. Now electric force is directly proportional to the product of the charge magnitudes. So electric force is directly proportional to the product of the charge magnitudes. And then it's going to be inversely proportional to the distance between the two objects. So we're going to start, or we're going to go back to up here where it says electric force is directly proportional to the product of the charge magnitudes. This makes sense. The larger the magnitudes of these charges, the more force they're going to have. So as the magnitudes get higher, the product of both of them com combined is going to get higher because we're looking at two charges here. So we're going to multiply the two magnitudes together to get a product. And so that's, as that goes up, the electric force is going to go up. Now the electric force is inversely proportional to the distance between the two objects. So the farther apart the two objects are, the smaller the electric force is going to be because as they're farther apart, they have less of an impact on each other. So we say they're inversely proportional because as the distance goes up, electric force goes down. But as electric force goes up, then the distance goes down. And when we say up here that electric force is directly proportional, that means when one goes up, the other one goes up, and when one goes down, the other one goes down. So that's a look at electric force. The electromagnetic spectrum is defined by frequency and wavelength. Frequency is abbreviated as a lowercase f and is frequently measured in hertz. And wavelength is abbreviated as a symbol that looks kind of like a lowercase h with more squiggles. And wavelength is measured in meters. Now because light travels at a fairly constant speed, frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength. This concept is illustrated in the formula Frequency equals C divided by wavelength. And C stands for the speed of light. The speed of light is about 300 million meters per second. Now, frequency multiplied by wavelength equals the speed of the wave. And for electromagnetic waves, this is going to be the speed of light, with some variance for the medium in which it is traveling. Now, electromagnetic waves include many different types of waves, as you can see here. So what I've done here is I've arranged these different types of waves from largest to smallest in terms of wavelength. So we have radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet radiation, x-rays, and gamma rays. Now the energy of electromagnetic waves is carried in packets that have a magnitude inversely proportional to the wavelength. We can define energy as the capacity to do work. And we could further define energy as a scalar quantity. And so when I say it's a scalar quantity, that means it's kind of like mass. It has a particular number and unit associated with it, but it doesn't matter in which direction the energy was applied. Now, a unit for energy is the joule, um, which is actually has a little j, but then when we abbreviate it, it has a capital J. So to give you an idea, 
of the unit joule. One joule is the amount of energy used to apply a force of one newton over a distance of one meter. So notice here that it applies both force and distance to come up with one single unit. Now you may be thinking, I said this was a scalar quantity, so direction didn't matter. Well, that's true. Because say you're pushing a box and you give it one newton of force, it does matter how far you pushed it, but it doesn't matter whether you push that box north, south, east, or west. So that's what we mean when we say it's a scalar quantity. It matters how hard you pushed it, but it doesn't matter in which direction you pushed it. Now some other units for energy are watts, calories, there are several British thermal units that, uh, for energy, kilowatt hours, which is used specifically for electricity. Now energy and work represent a force acting over a distance. So I'm going to say that again, it represents a force acting over a distance. And so when we think about work, we may think about just doing some, some type of physical activity or going to the place of work. Well, we have a physics definition for work, and that means to move something over a certain distance. And so if I pushed on this wall and I pushed really hard, I pushed all day, but the wall never moved, I didn't do any work by the physics definition. Now if I were to look at a big box on the ground and think I want to I move it across this parking lot, so I just push and push on it and slide it across the ground, now I'm doing work because I'm moving that box. You have to move something. And so remember I said energy, or, or the unit we use for energy, which is a joule, is one newton over a distance of one meter. So we notice here that distance is important. Because if I apply a force of one newton on the box, for one meter, I did quite a bit of work. But if I apply one newton of force over a distance of two meters, I'm doing even more work because it's, I'm pushing it even further. And so I used more work. And so energy is the capacity to do work. It's the ability to do work. It's just like if you get a good night's rest and you eat a lot of food, then you're going to have more energy to be able to do work than if you haven't eaten anything in a while and if you're pretty sleep deprived. So you have this more energy, you have more ability to do this work. And so if I push the box with a force of one newton over a distance of two meters, I use more energy than if I push the box with a force of one newton for only a distance of one meter. So you can see here the relationship between energy and work. Now I'm gonna draw a little bit of a, a box right here to talk about the relationship between energy and mass. And so we have an equation, which is E equals M with a little o, C squared. So E is obviously energy. And then we have M, which is mass. But in this case, notice it has a little o, which stands for the mass of the object. And then finally we have c squared, which is the speed of light in a vacuum. The speed of light in a vacuum. So that's the way that you can relate energy to mass. So you're looking at the mass of a particular object and then you use this, the speed of light in a vacuum, which is going to be a constant, and you're able to relate these two variables back and forth to each other. So again, energy is the capacity to do work. The ideal gas law is P times V equals N times R times T. P stands for pressure, V stands for volume, N stands for number of moles, in other words the amount. Moles is used to measure chemical substances. T is the absolute temperature, always in Kelvin, and R is the universal gas constant. And R takes different forms depending on the units that are needed. So R can look like this, or R can look like this. And notice the only difference here is the unit for pressure. Here kilopascals are used, and here atmospheres are used. So I want to go through an example problem so that we can better understand the practical application of this gas law. So the example problem we have is you have 30.0 liters of nitrogen gas at 373 Kelvin and 203 
kilopascals. How many moles of nitrogen gas do you have? All right, so we're looking for moles here. And remember, moles is in. So I'm going to put in question mark because that's what we're looking for here. All right, so let's go ahead and write the equation. PV equals nRT. All right, so we're looking for pressure. And we know that pressure is expressed in those units. So pressure is 203 kPa times volume, which is 30.0 liters. Now we're looking for moles, so we don't know what that is yet, so we'll just leave in there. Then we're looking for R, all right? And so we need to know which one to use, and the only difference here is the units. And so since we see kilopascals right here, that means we must be looking for that constant right there. So we have 8.31. Finally, times temperature, 373 Kelvin. So from here, we just need to divide by this right here. And because we're using algebra here, what we do to one side of the equation, we also have to do to the other. So we'll divide this side by the same thing. All right, so all this right here crosses out because we're dividing one thing by the same thing. So the only thing left here is N, which is what we're looking for. So I'll save you having to go through all the math here, but what you would do is just multiply these two numbers and then divide it by these two numbers that are multiplied by each other. And so N equals 1.96. Now we need to know what unit to use. So in this case, we're using moles. So I'll just abbreviate it MOL. And so that's the answer we were looking for. Now, if you're wondering exactly how we got the units, well, everything has to cross out for something like this to work. So we see kilopascals here and there, so that can cross out. We see liters here and here, so that can cross out. And then right here, we have moles and Kelvin times 373 Kelvin. So those right there cross out. Because if you look at it like this, kPa is over moles k. And then we're multiplying it like this. So actually, we don't need that number. So if we just, we're just looking at units now. So this is what the units actually look like. All right, so that got crossed out from up there. We cross that out like that. And then we're just left with moles. So that's, that's where we got the unit here. So that's the answer right there. So that's the practical application. Because you have this equation now, if any of these are missing, any of these variables are missing, you can find the missing one as long as you have all the other information. Now, obviously, the missing information is never going to be this constant because you already know it. But if you're wondering what the pressure, the volume, the number of moles, or the temperature is, as long as you know the other three variables, you can figure out that missing variable. Ionic bonds tend to form under two certain criteria. And the first is ionic bonds tend to form between metals and nonmetals. So if you have two elements, and one's a metal and one's a nonmetal, an ionic bond is likely to form. Now, the second criteria is that ionic bonds tend to form between elements with a large difference in electronegativity. So the larger the difference in electronegativity, the better the chance ionic bonds are going to form. And so if elements meet both of these criteria, there's a very good chance they're very likely to form ionic bonds. Now, Keep in mind that elements with the highest electronegativity values are in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table of elements, while those with the lowest are near the lower left-hand corner. So you have elements with low electronegativity down here and elements with high electronegativity up here. And so just by knowing those two facts right there, if you see an element on the periodic table, if you just imagine this board is the periodic table, and it's about right here, 
you just know by where it's geographically situated on the board that there's a really good chance that it has a high electronegativity because it's near the top right hand corner of the periodic table. Now I have some pairs of elements here and I want to examine these elements to see if they meet this criteria and determine whether or not they are likely to form ionic bonds. So first we have nitrogen and oxygen. Now nitrogen is a nonmetal, and then oxygen is obviously a nonmetal. So they are not likely to form ionic bonds because there is not between a metal and a nonmetal. We have two nonmetals here. Then we have potassium and fluorine, and potassium is an alkali metal. And fluorine is a nonmetal. So we've met the first criteria. We have reaction here between a metal and a nonmetal. So we're doing good so far. And then there, there's um, a high electronegativity difference here. And it's actually 3.2, which is pretty high. So they're likely to form ionic bonds, specifically potassium chloride. Now here we have barium and sulfur and barium is, an, is a metal and then sulfur is a nonmetal. So here we have a metal, a nonmetal, we're doing good so far so they're likely to form ionic bonds, uh, specifically barium sulfide and then in addition to that their electronegativity difference is moderately large at about 1.6. Now finally we have cesium and tin and cesium is an alkali metal and then I'm sure you can guess that tin is a metal. So here we have two metals interacting with each other so we do, it's not between a metal and a nonmetal. So these um, cesium and tin is not likely to form an ionic bond. So notice here the main factor here was that we had two nonmetals and two metals here. But when we have a metal and a nonmetal they're likely to form ionic bonds and especially if they have a high electronegativity difference. So hopefully through this short session you have a better understanding of ionic bonds. The strength of the ionic bond contributes to the property of hardness and brittleness in ionic compounds. Now you may be thinking, okay, how can something have the property of hardness and brittleness? Well, it can. And in this case, ionic compounds are both hard, but they also can be very brittle. And so there's a strong ionic bond between anions and cations. And this strong ionic bond causes the ions to be close together in tightly packed crystal lattices. And because they're close together, you have positive ions up next to negative ions. Now, when a force is applied to the crystal, the crystal deforms slightly. So I'm going to draw an arrow right here that represents force. And so now the crystal uh, deforms slightly. And this deformation brings the positive ions next to positive ions and negative ions next to negative ions. So now this is rearranged a little bit. And you have positive, 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 negative, 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 negative. And so now this is where the problem comes in. And the positive ions repel the positive ions and the negative ions repel the negative ions. So now positive and positive want to get away from each other and negative and negative want to get away from each other. And the repulsive forces between the similarly, similarly charged ions are so great that the crystal ends up shattering. And so that's how ionic compounds can be both hard and brittle. They're hard but they're also brittle because they can break under much force. And so the break is usually along defined planes within the crystal. Ionization energy is the amount of energy that it takes to remove the first valence electron of an atom. So basically ionization energy is a measure of how easy an atom loses its valence electrons. Atoms like sodium and potassium which give up valence electrons to form ions would have a low ionization energy because they give up their valence electrons easily. So if you think about the periodic table like a rectangle even though it's not a perfect rectangle you have rows or we can also call them periods that run from left to right. Now as you go from left to right the ionization 
energy increases. So the farther you go to the right down a row, the larger the ionization energy gets. So fluorine has a higher ionization energy than does lithium because fluorine is farther to the right than lithium. Now, as you go up the periodic table, up a column, or we can also call them groups, as you go up, the ionization energy also increases. Now, there's a reason for this. This is because of the shielding effect of inner electrons. For example, compared to cesium, lithium has fewer inner electrons between its nucleus and outer shell. Therefore, lithium has a higher ionization energy than cesium. So, an element that's over in this region is going to have a much higher ionization energy than one that's over here because this one's to the right and farther up in the periodic table. This one's lower and farther to the left. So just by knowing the two facts that ionization energy increases to the right and as you go farther up the periodic table, you can just look at an element, look at where it's geographically situated on the periodic table and get an idea of how high its ionization energy is when compared to other electrons. So the important thing to pull out of this session is that ionization energy is the amount of energy that it takes to remove the first valence electron of an atom. Isotopes are atoms of the same element. They are similar but a little bit different. They have the same number of electrons and protons, so they have the same atomic number, but they have different numbers of neutrons, which gives them different atomic masses. So one way to show the different isotopes of an element is by giving the element name, putting a dash, and then giving the atomic mass. So for hydrogen 1, there is one proton, one electron, and one neutron. So the atomic number is 1 because the atomic number is the amount of protons in an atom of that element. So there's one proton, so the atomic number is 1, and then the atomic mass is 1 because we see that number right there. Now for hydrogen 2, there's one proton, one electron, and two neutrons. Notice the number of protons and electrons isn't changing. So the atomic number is still 1, and the, the atomic mass is 2. Now the third example we have is hydrogen 3. Again, there's one proton and one electron. That's not going to change, so the atomic number is still 1. And then the atomic mass is going to be 3. So that's three examples, different isotopes of the same element. Now, isotopes of any given element are going to behave the same chemically. This happens because chemical activity is determined by the number of valence electrons, not the number of neutrons. So all isotopes of a given element have the same number of valence electrons. So they behave the same chemically. The three laws of thermodynamics are important to our understanding of energy and heat. So I've written each law up here on the board and then under each law written a brief summary of that law. So the first law of thermodynamics says that energy is always conserved. So take for example when I rub two, my two hands together. So I'm rubbing my hands together. So I'm exerting energy to rub my hands together. So it would look like my body is losing energy because I'm having to exert that energy to rub my hands together. But because I'm rubbing my hands together, I'm creating friction, which creates heat. And I can feel my hands getting warm right now. So although energy is coming out of my body to rub my hands together, it's changing forms into the form of heat. So heat is another form of energy. So energy is always conserved. It may change forms, but the energy is always there. You can't destroy energy. The second law of thermodynamics is that a system will develop a uniform temperature. So say I had a box, and inside that box I had two blocks of metal, and the blocks of metal were of equal weight. The first block of metal weighs 100 degrees, and the second block of metal weighs, um, the first block of metal is 100 degrees, and the second block of metal is zero degrees. So eventually those two blocks are going to balance each other out until both blocks weigh 50 degrees. So that's basically the second law of thermodynamics, that all the both blocks in the box are going to work together to find one temperature, an equilibrium, a temperature that each box, each uh, block is going to have. So this can be applied to many different things, any sort of system that you have where you have different um, objects inside that system and they have different temperatures. Eventually all the objects 
in that system are going to have the same temperature. The third law of thermodynamics is that entropy becomes constant as temperature approaches zero. Now, this doesn't really make sense unless you know what entropy is. Entropy is the flow of heat. So as the temperature approaches zero, the flow of heat becomes constant. So that's a look at the three laws of thermodynamics and how they affect our world. A lever consists of a bar or plank and a pivot point or fulcrum. Work is performed by the bar, which swings at the pivot point to redirect the force. So basically there's three components to a lever. We have force, which we will abbreviate as capital F. And then we have the fulcrum, or pivot point. Now, so we don't have two Fs, we're going to abbreviate this as PP. And then finally we have weight, which we'll abbreviate this as capital W. Now those are the main three components. Now there's also a bar, and the work is performed by the bar. So the easiest way for me to illustrate this is through the example of a seesaw. So we have a seesaw. We have something in the middle it's balancing on. Over here, force is applied, which I'm going to abbreviate as F. So here's the pivot point. And then over here is the weight. Now this right here, this board, is what we call the bar. And so work is performed by the bar, which swings at the pivot point. It swings right here to redirect the force. So the force is pushed down here, but the pivot point allows that force to be applied over here to push the weight up. Now there's three different types of lever. There's first class lever, second class, and third class. And so the different types of levers depend on the order of these three components, force, pivot point, and weight. So a C-cell happens to be a first class lever. So the first class lever is when you have the pivot point between the force and the weight. Now another word for weight is resistance, another word for force is effort. So there's lots of different words that can be used here that can be um, interchangeable. So, so, so some other examples of a first class lever in addition to a seesaw would be something like balances, nail extractors, or scissors. Now with a second class lever, the weight is between the force and pivot point. So the easiest way to illustrate these types of levers is through a seesaw, because when we start using examples like nail extractors are a type of first class lever, it's hard to really imagine what that looks like in the placement of force, pivot point, and weight. So I'm going to rearrange our seesaw here to be a second class lever. So we would have force over here, but we would switch weight and pivot point. So we'd have the weight in the middle, and then we'd have the pivot point over here. Now that seesaw wouldn't work really well, I wouldn't recommend getting on it. So there's not actually a seesaw that's an example of a second class lever. Instead we have the wheelbarrow. So I'm going to do my best to draw a wheelbarrow here. So we have the wheel here, and then we have the handles. So the wheel, of course, is going to be the pivot point. Then we're going to have the weight in here, the load. And then over here we're going to have the force, because whoever's pushing the wheelbarrow is going to be picking up over here. So here we have the weight between the force and the pivot point. So that's an example of a second class lever, um, as is um, something like pry bars, bottle openers, or nutcrackers. And then finally we go to the third class lever. And so again, if I rearrange my seesaw, we'll find that the weight is over here, the force is over here, and the pivot point is down here. So the pivot point stayed in the same place, but force and weight switched places. Now again, the seesaw wouldn't really work, and so I'm going to use a baseball bat as an example of a third class lever. Now we should never say that a third class lever is when you have weight, then force, then pivot point. Instead we should say that the force comes between the weight and the pivot point. Because really you could switch these or turn this around and it would still work exactly the same. In the same way a second class lever is when pivot point, excuse me, when weight is between force and pivot point, and a first class lever is when pivot point is in the middle. So these types of levers are defined by what's in the middle. So now we're going to draw a baseball bat. 
Again, excuse my drawing. So over here we have weight. Now, really, the ball touching the bat is not really weight, but it's the resistance. So bear with me there. And then over here we have the force, because that's where the hands are. And then right here down at the end is where we have the pivot point. So notice that force is in the middle. So it's a third class lever. Some other examples are fishing rods, hammers, and tweezers. So that's a look at the three types of levers. Now, a lever is one of the six types of simple machines, which uses a concept called mechanical advantage to make work easier. Light is the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that is visible because of its ability to stimulate the retina. Light is absorbed and emitted by electrons, atoms, and molecules that move from one energy level to another. So an atom might release energy to move to a lower energy level, but absorb energy to move to a higher energy level. Now, visible light is between ultraviolet and infrared light on the spectrum. So it's anywhere from 380 nanometers all the way up to 760 nanometers. So 380 would correspond to the color violet, and 760 would co correspond to the color red. This is because the human brain interprets or perceives visible light as color. For example, when the entire wavelength reaches the retina, the brain perceives the color white. Now, when no part of the wavelength reaches the retina, the brain perceives the color black. Atoms and molecules can gain or lose energy only in particular discrete amounts. Therefore, they can absorb and emit light only at wavelengths that correspond to these amounts. So, using a process known as spectroscopy, these characteristic wavelengths can be used to identify substances. Some common types of lipids that you are probably familiar with are fats, oils, and waxes. Now, like carbohydrates, lipids are organic molecules. However, lipids have a more complex structure than carbohydrates and are larger molecules. Now, lipids include several different types of groups. And so the first is triglycerides. And so stated somewhat simply, triglycerides consist of glycer a glycerol molecule that is bound to three long chain fatty acids. So glycerol is a polyalcohol and fatty acids are long chain carboxylic acids. So triglycerides are the most common lipids and make up fats and oils. Now a second grouping is phospholipids. And these consist of two fatty acids bound to a phosphate head group. And so the fatty acid portions avoid water, meaning they're hydrophobic, while the phosphate head groups seek water, meaning they're hydrophilic. So phospholipids have a structural function. They make up a cell and organelle membranes in your body. A third group is steroids, which are lipids that are derived from cholesterol. Steroids have a four-ring structure with a hydroxyl group at one end and a short carbon chain at the opposite end. Cholesterol is also found in cell membranes and circulates in the blood. Another type of steroids are hormones. Now, the fourth group of lipids that we're going to talk about are waxes, which are formed when a long-chain alcohol binds to a long-chain fatty acid. So again, some common types of lipids are fats, oils, and waxes. And like cholesterol, lipids are organic molecules.
a magnet is basically just a substance that has a magnetic field. Now the magnetic field isn't visible, you can't see it in the air, but you can see the results of it. Take a refrigerator magnet, for example. It attracts the refrigerator door to itself, and so you can see the result of the magnetic field because the magnet is sticking to the refrigerator door. You can also see the results of a magnetic field when two magnets interact with each other. You may have noticed that if you put two magnets near each other, they are attracted to each other and come closer to each other. But then if you turn one of the magnets around, they repel each other and push away from each other. When talking about magnetic materials, we refer to the materials as ferromagnetic because they have the ability to have a magnetic field. And within the category of ferromagnetic materials, we have soft materials and hard materials. A soft ferromagnetic material, some type of material that responds to a magnetic field and will have that magnetic field for a little bit, but quickly loses it. Now every substance on Earth in some way responds to a magnetic field, but soft ferromagnetic materials are the ones that respond a little bit more to that magnetic field. Now a hard ferromagnetic material is some kind of material that responds very well to a magnetic field. It takes on that magnetic field and contains it for a long time. Permanent magnets are made out of hard ferromagnetic materials because they're given a magnetic field and they keep it and it's really hard to bring, um, tr really hard to take away that magnetic field from that substance such as a refrigerator magnet. It's been magnetized and it's hard to unmagnetize it. There's also something involving magnets called an electromagnet. An electromagnet is basically a coil wrapped around some sort of soft ferromagnetic material. So when electricity is turned on, the coil becomes magnetized. And when you turn the electricity off, it no longer has a magnetic field. The soft ferromagnetic material that it's wrapped around is generally steel. And so again, just when you turn the electricity on, the coil and the steel inside of it um, exert a magnetic field. Then when you turn the electricity off, they no longer have a magnetic field. So those are some of the important things to remember about magnets. Mechanical advantage is the term used to describe how simple machines make accomplishing work easier. Now a certain amount of work is required to move an object. And the amount of work cannot be reduced. So how then does mechanical advantage re reduce the amount of work you have to do when it says right here the amount of work cannot be reduced? Well, mechanical advantage makes work easier by changing the way work is performed. So say, for instance, that you need to move an object to a given vertical height. And so a certain, amount of a certain amount of work is required to move that object to that vertical height. Now by getting to that given height at an angle, the effort required is reduced, but the distance that must be traveled to reach the given height is increased. And so although the effort required is reduced, the length of time you have to be pushing or holding that object is increased. And so overall, the amount of work stays the same, but overall it's easier to accomplish that work. So a great example of this is walking up a hill. So say we have a hill right here. If someone wanted to get to the top of this hill but they're down here, they could take a direct route to the top. So it's going to be very steep but they don't have to walk very far. But someone else could take a longer route, a meandering route, and go like this. And so as they progress up the hill, they're getting to walk up the hill at an angle. So they're only increasing in elevation slowly, much slower than the person over here who took the direct route. So it requires a lot less effort to walk here because they're not having to gain as much elevation as quickly. But the difference here is that you see how much farther they had to walk than this person because they had to go back and forth. And so even though it was easier to walk up, it took them longer. So the same amount of work is required for both of these. However, mechanical advantage is used right here by the person walking up this hill. It makes it easier for overall for that person to walk up the hill. 
And so there's basically six different types of simple machines that use the concept of mechanical advantage. And those are the inclined plane, the lever, the wheel and axle, the pulley, the wedge, and the screw. And so those six simple machines use mechanical advantage and those simple machines can be combined together to gain e even more mechanical advantage. When a substance melts, the atoms, ions, or molecules that make it up begin to become loosely associated. Now, in order to make the, the atoms, the ions, or the molecules loosely associated, it takes energy. And so it's energy that's used to make them loosely associated. So you need lots of energy. Now, ionic compounds have high bond energies. So because of, if anything's an ionic compound, it's going to take a high bond energy to break it up, to loosen everything up. And if you're not familiar with the bond energy, basically that's the amount of energy it takes to break something up into its original parts. So basically it's the amount of energy that it takes to break an ionic compound up. Now, aluminum oxide is an ionic compound of aluminum and oxygen. So remember, I said it's an ionic compound, so that means it must have a high bond energy. Um, and so it's going to have a higher bond energy than its original parts. And so the melting point for aluminum is 660 degrees Celsius. But since we have an ionic compound here of aluminum oxide, you know the melting point is going to have to be very, um, it's going to have to be even higher because the ionic bond between aluminum ions and oxygen's ions is very strong. So the melting point of aluminum oxide is a lot higher. Like I said, it's actually going to be 2,054 degrees Celsius. So you can see here how much of a difference in the melting point ionic, ionic compounds make. So the important thing to remember is that when a substance melts, the atoms, ions, or molecules that make it up become loosely associated. A molecule is an electrically neutral combination of two or more atoms of the same or different elements joined by covalent bonds. So I want to go ahead and break down this definition a little bit to make sure we really understand it. Notice up here it says that the molecule is electrically neutral. So that means it has no net charge. So any positive or negative charges in that molecule cancel each other out so there's no net charge. In other words, it's neutral. Now, it's a combination of two or more atoms. Now, so this could look like this. Two hydrogen atoms or one oxygen atom and one hydrogen atom together would work as well because they have to be of the same or different element. So either one of these works as a molecule. Now, these are some really simple examples of molecules. And so molecules can be simple like those right there, or they can be as complex as large biochemical macromolecules such as proteins, starches, and cellulose. Now proteins can range in size from 50 to more than 2,000 amino acids linked by peptide bonds, while starches and cellulose molecules can consist of more than 10,000 smaller glucose molecules covalently linked together. Now there are some substances out there, three in particular that I want to highlight, that you may think are molecules which actually are not classified as molecules. So I want to go over those. So one is aggregations of polar molecules joined temporarily by hydrogen bonds. Another example is electrically charged ions joined by ionic bonds. And then finally, metals consisting of positively charged ions in a sea of delocalized electrons. So these three substances that I just listed, you may be inclined to classify these as molecules, but they actually are not. So I just wanted to warn you about those. So let's just review the definition for molecules again. That's something that's electrically neutral. 
of two or more atoms of the same or different elements, and they're joined together by covalent bonds. So remember all these things. They're neutral. There has to be two, but there can also be more. Same elements or different elements. And they have to be joined by covalent bonds. So generally, when you have a definition of something, it just usually is maybe twofold. Here, there's lots of different criteria something has to meet in order to be a molecule. So you want to be able to remember all these so that you can see a substance, learn a little bit about it, and be able to identify if it is indeed a molecule. Organic compounds are basically compounds that contain carbon. There are two main ways to classify organic compounds. The first is by classifying where they come from. So you would have natural organic compounds and synthetic organic compounds. The second classification system is based upon how large the compounds are. So you have small molecule and polymers. In this case, we're going to take a look at the first classification system. So natural compounds are just what the name implies, compounds that can be found naturally in nature. So these natural compounds are produced by plants and animals, and humans take those compounds and use them for their own use. Sugar is a great example of a natural compound because it's naturally occurring in nature because it's produced by plants. Synthetic compounds are produced by humans, and humans produce it and then use it for their own use. Now, sometimes these synthetic compounds can actually also be produced by nature, but for whatever reason, industry has found it more efficient to produce it synthetically. A great example is rubber. Rubber can be produced naturally by plants, but industry today finds it more efficient to synthetically produce rubber. So that's a quick look at organic compounds and how they can be divided up into natural organic compounds and synthetic organic compounds. The periodic table is a way to systematically display the chemical elements. Now notice I said that it consists of chemical elements and it consists of elements only. So this, this does not include uh, mixtures and compounds because an element is basically matter in its most basic form. The periodic table positions chemical elements based upon atomic number. An atomic number is the amount of protons an atom has in its nucleus. So hydrogen is the first element on the periodic table because it has one proton in its nucleus. And then the next chemical element has more protons in its nucleus. Like I said, the periodic table arranges chemical elements very systematically. So if you were to take a look at one row on the periodic table, all the chemical elements on that one row would have the same number of electron shells. And if you were to take a look at one column, all the chemical elements in that column would have the same electron configuration. So the periodic table arranges the elements in such a way that all the elements are next to similar elements. So if a scientist knew a lot about one element, he can know a lot about the elements around it just because all the elements are grouped together with similar elements. There are about 118 elements out there, but only 114 have been officially recognized. And 98 of those are natural elements, ones that naturally occur in nature, such as potassium, nickel, and hydrogen. The other ones are synthetically produced by humans, such as Einsteinium. So the important thing to remember about the periodic table is that it consists of chemical elements and it is arranged by atomic number. pH is basically a measure of how many hydrogen ions are in a substance. pH is very important to many fields such as biology, chemistry, medicine, food science, farming, and water treatment. I've written up here on the board a pH scale ranging from numbers 0 to 14 each indicating the amount of pH in a substance. Now there are pHs that go higher than 14, but for practical purposes, this is the largest pH scale we need. Water has a pH of seven, and any substance with a pH larger than seven is considered a base. So everything from seven over to 14 is considered a base. Common bases that you probably know of are baking soda and bleach. Now any substance with a pH below seven is considered an acid. Some of those that you may know of are lemon juice, um, tomato juice, and gastric acid. So water is kind of the middle bar on the pH scale and anything to the right is the base and anything to the left is an acid. Photosynthesis can basically be described 
as the process by which plants use the energy from the sun to produce food for themselves. But we're going to take a look at a more complex definition of photosynthesis, and we're going to take a look at what the reaction actually looks like that makes that happen. So photosynthesis is chlorophyll containing autotrophs using the energy and sunlight to convert carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrates. So another way of saying autotrophs is by saying primary producer. So this is basically a plant that's not consuming anything to make its energy. It's making its own food and energy. And so primary and secondary consumers are what consume the autotrophs. And so they're not converting sunlight into carbohydrates. They're using sunlight to power, basically, the conversion from carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrates because light is a form of energy. All right, so this is what the reaction actually looks like. We have light plus 6 moles of carbon dioxide and 12 moles of water to make our carbohydrates. So that's what we're going for, but it also produces oxygen and water, but oxygen is considered a waste product because the, the goal of this reaction is not to create oxygen, it's to create this carbohydrate. Now, the process of photosynthesis involves two stages, the light reaction and the dark reaction. So in the, in the light reaction, phot photons from light provide the energy to split a water molecule. And the electrons released are boosted into higher energy states and generate reducing equivalents and the energy carrying molecule ATP, which is an abbreviation for adenosine triphosphate. And so we're going get to get to that in a minute. And then we have the dark reaction, which we can also describe as the Calvin-Benson cycle. And here, atmospheric carbon dioxide is captured and converted by the reducing equivalents and ATP into first three carbon sugars, and then later converted into six carbon sugar phosphates, and then into sucrose, starch, and cellulose. So notice here that ATP is used. It's produced in the light reaction, but it's used in the dark reaction. So these two reactions are not mutually exclusive. They are dependent on each other. A polymer is a large molecule which is composed of repeating units of smaller molecules that are chemically bound together. So it's a large molecule and it's composed of repeating units of smaller molecules. And we can call these smaller molecules monomers. And so a monomer is basically the subunit or the building block for polymers. Because notice here the prefix mono and the prefix poly. Poly means more than one and mono means one. And so this is just one molecule, but when these one molecules join together in repeating units that are chemically bound together, they form a polymer. Now, the repeating unit may be made of one or more different monomers. So some polymers are made up of the same type of monomer, whereas others are made up of different types of monomers. So we have names for those different types of polymers. So the first being a homopolymer. And the second type being a copolymer. So homopolymers consist of only one type of monomer, whereas copolymers consist of more than one type of polymer. Now, one other fact about polymers, polymers, polymers may form straight or branch chains. So it just depends on the polymer as to whether or not they're forming straight or branch chains. Now, there are two types of reactions that are used to make polymers. So one is condensation, and the other is addition. So the way condensation works is it deals with the removal of water in the form of a hydrogen atom from one monomer and a hydroxyl group from an adjacent monomer. So a new bond forms between those monomers. Now addition works by the electrons of the double bond within a monomer being rearranged to form single bonds with other monomers. So basically you're altering the chemical makeup of these monomers to form new bonds between monomers. And so that's a look at polymers.
We can classify cells into two categories, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. So prokaryotic cells are smaller than eukaryotic cells. In addition to being smaller, they lack membrane-bound nucleuses. So they don't have a membrane-bound nucleus. Now, they contain single-stranded circular DNA molecules that free float in, you can probably guess, they free float in cytoplasm, because cytoplasm is kind of the fluid in a cell that all the other organelles in the cell float around in. So the DNA molecules free float in cytoplasm. So some different organelles that are in prokaryotic cells are ribosomes, centrioles, often one or more flagella, and cytoskeleton elements. Then we have eukaryotic cells, and so these are going to be obviously larger than prokaryotic cells. And these contain linear double-stranded DNA combined with histone and packaged as chromosomes. And then the chromosomes are found inside a nucleus bounded by two membranes. So notice here, the eukaryotic cells do have a mem membrane-bound nucleus. Now, eukaryotic cells contain a variety of other membrane-bound organelles, such as mitochondria, chloroplast, endoplasmic reticula, Golgi bodies, lysosomes, and vacuoles. Now, eukaryotic ribosomes are larger and more complex than those found in prokaryotes, which is what well, is another way of saying prokaryotic cells. Now, you may be wondering, where do you find prokaryotic cells and where do you find eukaryotic cells? Well, prokaryotic cells are usually in single-celled organisms, such as bacteria, whereas eukaryotic cells are what you find in more complex organisms. It's what you see, on a, see the result of on a daily basis, because plants and animals are made up of eukaryotic cells. So that's a look at prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells and the differences between them. A pulley consists of a rope or line that is run around a wheel. A pulley allows force to be directed in a downward motion to lift an object. So say you had a 10 pound object that you needed to move 50 feet in the air, where you're going to have to attach a rope to it and pull that rope in an upward motion 50 feet to get that object suspended 50 feet in the air. Now if you use a pulley, it makes this work much easier. You're still having to apply the same amount of force, but you're able to apply that force in a downward direction. So we have a pulley right here, we have a rope around it, and then we have this triangle that weighs 10 pounds. And then this rope is 50 feet. And then there's a person down here pulling on the rope. And so the load is moved the same distance as the rope pulling it. Now actually this rope might be like 100 feet long or 75 feet long. Well, in this case what this means is, is that the distance between the top of the pulley and the object you're moving is 50 feet here. And so you're going to have to pull that rope 50 feet to get the object up here. So that's a very simple concept to understand. Now, say you used a combination pulley, such as a double pulley. The weight has moved half the distance of the rope pulling it. And then to explain that, I'm going to have to draw a diagram. So basically what we have here is a pulley here with the 10 pound object on it. Then we have another pulley up here and then the force is being applied right here. So this pulley stays in place kind of like this pulley, but this pulley moves around with the object. So this triangle here is still 10 pounds. Over here, the work was not necessarily made any easier because you still had to apply 10 pounds of force. Now here, a big difference is made since we're using a double pulley. You only have to apply 5 pounds of force because the other five pounds is being held up over here next to the ceiling or the tree or whatever this is 
over here. So now you're thinking the work is a lot easier, but remember what I said a second ago. The weight has moved half the distance of the rope pulling it. Okay, so say this rope right here is 50 feet, and so you want to move this triangle all the way to up here. Well, you don't have to, you have to pull the rope more than 50 feet, because say you pull the rope 10 feet. Well, five of those feet would be used to reduce the distance right here, but five of those feet would be used to reduce the distance right here, and so as that happens, the pulley's going to move up and up and up. So really, if you want to move this triangle 50 feet, you're going to have to pull the rope 100 feet. And so the work here really isn't reduced because you can't reduce the amount of work because work is moving an object over a distance. So you can only reframe that work to make it easier. So here, you don't have to apply as much force. You only have to apply half as much force, but you have to apply it for twice as long. So now you may be thinking, does that really make it any easier? Well, with you know, 10 pounds, a 10-pound weight you're trying to move, not really. But try to think of this in a different sense. Say this weighed 200 pounds. You may not be able to move a 200 pound weight at all, but say you only have to apply 100 pounds of force now. Now you're going to have to do it twice as much, but that's a lot better because you weren't able to even move, you weren't even able to budge the 200 pound weight, but now you have a 100 pound weight which is more manageable and so you can actually move that weight. So yes, a double pulley definitely does come in handy. So remember again that a pulley uses this concept of mechanical advantage to make work easier because it changes the way you're doing work. It doesn't necessarily lessen the amount of work, but it just makes it easier for the person doing that work. Radioactivity is the decay of the nucleus of an unstable atom. Now, the stability or the instability is a balance of the strong nuclear force which holds the nucleus together and the electromagnetic force that repels the protons. Unstable nuclei will decay when the nucleus emits either particles or energy. Now, there are three types of radioactivity, alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. Alpha particles are the nuclei of helium atoms, and they have high energies, though they travel short distances. Beta particles are electrons emitted from the nucleus. Now, they don't participate in chemical reactions. And do not come from orbitals. So they don't participate in chemical reactions and they do not come from orbitals. And then finally we come to gamma rays, which are electromagnetic waves emitted from the nucleus. And they have high energy. Now, alpha particles uh, cannot penetrate paper or skin. Now, beta particles cannot penetrate aluminum foil, and gamma rays can be stopped by lead. So that gives you an idea of the strength of these radioactive particles or rays. So again, radioactivity is the decay of the nucleus of an unstable atom, and unstable nuclei will decay when the nucleus emits either particles or energy. Reduction is when the atoms or ions of an element become more negative or less positive than they were before. So in other words, when an atom or ion undergoes a change in oxidation state in the negative direction, it is reduced. So take a look at this reaction right here between sodium and chlorine. Here, the chlorine becomes a chloride ion because it's becoming negative here. And that's why it has the negative symbol right here. Now, the element chlorine has an oxida oxidation state of zero. And that's because all elements and their natural state have oxidation numbers equal to zero. Now, the chloride ion has an oxidation state of negative one.
So the net change of oxidation for chlorine is in the negative direction. So by definition, chlorine is reduced here. Now, whenever an atom in a reaction gets reduced, some other atom gets oxidized. That's because what determines reduction is how many electrons something has, or if, um, if the atom is gaining electrons. So when an atom gains electrons, then that means some other atom had to give up electrons. Those electrons didn't come out of nowhere. So another atom had to give up electrons, becoming less negative. And so that's oxidation. Oxidation is the, the opposite of reduction. So there's a balance here. When, when one atom gains electrons, another one loses it. But the atom that gains electrons is considered to be reduced. Silicates are silicon compounds in which a silicon atom forms the central atom in a tetrahedron with four oxygen atoms. Now, the tetrahedrons are bound together in various geometries. Silicates are the major compounds in the Earth's crust. Various minerals are different arrangements of silicates with other atoms interlaced in the crystals. So, for example, the mineral thorfidite has a scandium in the crystal, while instatite has magnesium and quartz is a hard crystalline silicate. So starting out, the process starts with quartz melting. And this quartz melts at around 1600 degrees Celsius. And after the quartz melts, it forms a viscous liquid. And viscous and viscosity refer to the thickness of a liquid. So when we say it formed a viscous liquid, this means it's a very thick liquid that can easily become glass. So the next step is, it, is for it to cool quickly. Because if this liquid is cooled quickly, then the tetrahedrons do not have time to make orderly arrangements. And so what happens is an amorphous solid is formed. And what amorphous means is that it has no particular shape. And so we call this amorphous solid glass. And so the reason it has no particular shape is because those tetrahedrons did not have time to make orderly arrangements because the cooling happened so quickly. Now, various glasses have different minerals in them. So one type of glass is what we would call common glass. And common glass, we can also call sodium lime, soda lime glass. And that has calcium oxide and sodium oxide in the crystal. Another type is lead crystal glass. And this type of glass has lead monoxide in the crystal matrix. And the third type is cobalt glass. And this has cobalt oxide in it, and that cobalt oxide gives it a blue color. The solar system consists of the sun and the eight major planets that orbit around it. So first we have the sun, and then I'm going to order the eight major planets in order of how close they are to the sun. So we start out with Mercury, then Venus, then the third from the sun is Earth, then we have Mars, and then in between Mars and the next planet we have an asteroid belt. And then after that asteroid belt is Jupiter, and then Saturn, Uranus, then Neptune. Now you may be thinking Pluto should come after Neptune. Well, Pluto is no longer considered to be a planet. Now it's considered to be, or it's classified as one of the five known trans-Neptunian objects regarded as minor planets. So then after Neptune, we have the Kuiper Belt. And so this Kuiper Belt extends from 
about 30 astronomical units from Neptune. to about 50 astronomical units. So an astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the earth, and so that's 150 million kilometers. So the Kuiper belt extends from Neptune at 30 astronomical units out to about 50 astronomical units. So that's a total of one light year, or 9.5 trillion kilometers from the sun. And so this contains countless numbers of icy bodies of water, methane, and ammonia, some with rocky cores. Now beyond the Kuiper belt lies the hypothesized spherical Oort cloud, thought to be the source of long period comets. So that's the Oort cloud. And so there's eight major planets, so I'm going to put a check mark next to those. And again, these are in order from the distance they orbit the sun. So notice here that if you remember any kind of certain phrase to remember the order of the planets, notice that there's two M's, and so Mercury is the closest to the Sun, and then Mars is after Earth. But all the other planets start with different letters. So the order is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. I want to take a look at the properties of solutions and some different types of solutions. But first off, we need to define what a solution is. And it's a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances in a single phase. So by homogeneous, we mean the same. In other words, you don't have two substances somewhat mixed together. They are completely mixed together, forming one substance or one solution. And they're in a single phase. In other words, they're either all the components of the mixture are either in liquid, solid, or gas form. They're not in different forms. So every substance in the mixture is combined together to be the same in the same phase. And in the case of a solution, the particles are distributed uniformly throughout the volume, and the molecules do not react chemically with each other. So in any solution, you have two parts, the solvent and the solute. Now, like we said, a solution can be made up of two or more substances. But here, we're just going to pretend that there's two substances. So we have the solvent and the solute. We have one solvent and one solute. So consider water and sugar. So the solvent here would be water, and the solute would be sugar. So the solvent is what is dissolving something, and the solute is what is being dissolved. So if you were to put sugar inside water, water would be the solvent because it would dissolve the sugar and the sugar would be the solute because it's being dissolved. Now like I said earlier, when you put sugar into water, the sugar is not going to stay in there. It may go to the bottom at first, but if you stir it around, eventually the water is going to break down those, those sugar, the little pieces of sugar, until the sugar is completely dissolved and the sugar is going to be distributed uniformly throughout the volume. If you were to take a teaspoon of that water, there'd be a certain amount of sugar in that water. And if you were to take another teaspoon out of that water, there'd be the same amount of sugar in that section of the water because the particles are distributed uniformly throughout the volume. And now notice that the water was in liquid form and the sugar was in solid form. But notice that they're in a single phase now. The sugar has become liquid form. And then we also, we said they form a homogeneous mixture. There's not some pieces of sugar in some water. The sugar has now been completely dissolved in the water, so now you just have sugar water as a whole. And then also, the water and sugar are not reacting chemically with each other. Now, there are three different kinds of solutions. Gaseous solutions, liquid solutions, and solid solutions. And now, the name associated with each kind of solutions des um, describes the phase of the solvent. So in the case of a gaseous solution, the solvent is in the gas phase. And in a liquid solution, the solvent is in the liquid phase. And then, I'm sure you're getting the picture, in a solid and solid solutions, the solvent is in the solid phase. And then the solute can be in any phase. So that's just three ways to classify a certain type of solution. But the important thing to remember, if you just take one thing away from this session, is that a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances in a single phase is what we call a solution.
sound is a pressure disturbance that moves through a medium in the form of mechanical waves. And these mechanical waves transfer energy from one particle to the next. So notice here that sound needs a medium to travel through. And so that can be something like air, water, or some other matter. But either way, sound has to have a medium to travel through. And then the reason it needs to travel through something is because it's transferring energy from one particle to the next. Now another thing you need to know about sound is that sound is transferred through vibrations. Vibrations transfer energy to adjacent particles. Now this may be a little bit contrary to what you thought about sound because you may think that sound is the actual movement of particles over a great distance, but actually the particles aren't moving. Instead vibrations transfer energy from one particle to an adjacent particle and that way sound moves out through the waves into other areas, but actual matter is not moving with the sound. The sound is just moving from one particle to the next. And so sound is transferred through the movement of atomic particles. And so these can be atoms or molecules. Now, waves consist of two things. We have compressions and rarefaction. So a compression is when particles are forced together. And so the opposite of that is a rarefraction. So this is when particles move farther apart and their density decreases. So you have comp a compression with particles moving together and a rarefraction with those particles moving apart. So one compression and one rarefraction constitutes a sound wave. Now waves of sound energy move outward in all directions from the source. So you have a source right here, a source of sound, and so you have waves moving out in all directions. So actually if you were to look at what this would look like scientifically, you'd have all these waves coming off, but that takes a long time to draw. And so different sounds have different wavelengths. And then the last thing that you prob probably should know is that sound is a form of kinetic energy. Now it's, when I say it's a form of kinetic energy, that's as opposed to potential energy. Which sound isn't going to be potential energy because it's not energy stored up. Sound is energy in motion, so we call it kinetic energy energy. A glass rod and a plastic rod can illustrate the concept of static electricity due to friction. So here we have a glass rod and over here we have a plastic rod. Now both of these rods start out with no charge because they have the same amount of electrons as protons. Now there's something called the electron affinity of a material, which is a property that helps determine how easily it can be charged by friction. And so basically we could say electron affinity is how easily an atom accepts an electron. So if something has a high electron affinity, then that means it loves accepting electrons or it can easily accept electrons. So materials can be sorted by their affinity for electrons into a triboelectric series. So we have some substances that have high affinities like celluloid, sulfur, and rubber. And then of course there's others that have low affinities such as glass, rabbit fur, and asbestos. So back to our example of the two rods. Say you were able to take a glass rod and rub it on some silk. Now in this example 
the silk has a higher affinity than the glass. So because it has a higher affinity, it desires electrons more than glass. So electrons are going to go from the glass to the silk. So that gives the glass rod a positive charge because now it has less negative charges, so it has more positive charges overall, giving it a positive charge. Now say we were to take the plastic, the plastic rod and we were to rub it against some fur. Now in this case, the plastic has a higher affinity than the fur because remember rabbit fur has a low affinity. So over here we have the higher affinity. So the electrons are going to go from the fur to the plastic. So what that does is that gives the plastic rod more negative charges. So that gives it an overall negative charge. So those are some illustrations of the concept of static electricity. Elemental sulfur comes from deposits in the ground. Now, sulfur has two physical properties that are used in the extraction process, and those are low melting point and low density. Now, the extraction process is called the frash process, and there's basically seven steps to how it works, but the steps aren't very complicated, so we're going to go ahead and dive right in. So, starting out, a well is drilled into a sulfur mineral deposit. So after that well is drilled, superheated water is pumped into the deposit. And so this superheated water is usually heated to around 170 degrees Celsius, which is about 340 degrees Fahrenheit. So that water is pumped down into the deposit. And as a result of that, the hot water melts the sulfur in the deposit. Now remember earlier I talked about two physical properties of sulfur that are useful in the extraction process. And the first was its low melting point. So you've already seen that come into play. The low melting point of sulfur allows for the water to melt that sulfur. Now remember that although this is melted, the sulfur is still down in that deposit, but we're trying to extract that sulfur. So in addition to superheated water being pumped into the well, compressed air is going to be pumped down into the well. And so because of that compressed air, the molten sulfur comes to the surface because all that air is forcing it to the surface. Now remember earlier I talked about the two physical properties. Well, the second one was low density. So you've also seen that physical property come into play the low density of sulfur allows compressed air to be able to push it to the surface. Now that the molten sulfur is at the surface, it can cool and solidify. And so from there, the sulfur forms a rhombic crystal. And so a rhombic crystal has eight molecules. So those are the seven steps to the extraction of sulfur and what we call the frash process. The scientific method is a process that has been around for over a thousand years that is used by scientists to make scientific discoveries. There's a progression in the scientific method. The scientist starts by asking a question that the scientist wants to have answered. In this case, the question is going to be, which cat is faster? The scientist is interested in knowing if the lion or the cheetah is faster. Then the scientist, based off of prior knowledge, is going to formulate a hypothesis. In this case, the hypothesis is going to be the cheetah is faster. Notice how the hypothesis is written as an established fact. It's because through the experiment portion of the scientific method, the scientist is going to try to prove his hypothesis true. 
Then comes the prediction portion of the scientific method. In this portion, the scientist is going to try to clarify his hypothesis. So in this case, the prediction is going to be the cheetah will be faster over a 60 meter period. It's important to realize the difference between a hypothesis and a prediction. A hypothesis is stated as established fact, and the experiment is either going to prove or disprove the hypothesis. The prediction clarifies the hypothesis, because otherwise the experiment could just prove that the cheetah is faster over a two meter period, but that doesn't really show any endurance on the cheetah's part. So the prediction says that the experiment results are going to show that the cheetah will be faster than the lion over a 60 meter period. Then comes the test portion of the scientific method. This is very important. This is the experiment part of the scientific method. This is when the scientist either proves or disproves his hypothesis. So I'm going to write here that the scientist is going to use a radar gun. So the scientist is going to point the radar gun at a cheetah running over a 60 meter period and write down how fast the cheetah was running and then point the radar gun at a lion running over a 60 meter period and write down the speed of the lion. Then comes the analysis portion of the scientific method. This is when the scientist looks at the results and decides whether they prove or disprove the hypothesis. So in this case, the analysis is going to prove and confirm the hypothesis. So I'm going to write here that the hypothesis is confirmed because the results of the experiment showed that indeed the cheetah was faster than the lion. So if my example confused you a little bit, don't worry about it. The important thing to remember is the main points of the scientific method. The question, hypothesis, prediction, test, and analysis. The sun. The sun is at the center of the solar system which is a system surrounding the sun, solar having to do with sun. It is composed of 70% hydrogen, 28% helium, and 2% various metals. So there are a small percentage of metals that make up parts of the sun. Now, the sun is one of uh, about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And stars are basically just balls of burning gas, hydrogen and helium being the primary gases of the sun. So since it's a ball of burning gas, it's going to have some high temperatures. Now, its diameter is about 1,390,000 kilometers. And to give you some perspective, that's about 109 times Earth's diameter. So if you lined up 109 Earths in a row, that would be about the diameter of the sun, which means if you stretched it out, it would be that far apart and go all the way around that distance each time. So the sun is really, really big. It doesn't look that big from us, from where we are, but that's because we're very far away from it. Because it is such a large star and it is the closest one to us, we are able to see it and we do um, benefit from some of its effects. Now the mass of the sun is around 1.989 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. So that means if we put these three numbers and then 27 zeros behind it, that would tell you how many kilograms uh, the sun has for mass, which is, to give you perspective again, about 330,000 times Earth's mass. The sun represents over 99.8% of the total mass of the solar system. So, within the solar system, this is 330 times the mass of Earth. Um, and since it was 109 Earths, uh, and then you keep multiplying that exponentially whenever you're figuring out the mass because it's not 
It's 109 Earths in a row, but not 109 Earths volume-wise. So it's 330 times Earth's mass. And because the sun is so big, within the solar system, the sun uh, is 99.8% is of the total mass of the solar system. So whenever you're thinking about how big Earth is and the other planets, in relation to those planets, in relation to Earth, the sun is huge. It's taking up the vast majority of the mass, or it's, it makes up the vast majority of the mass in the solar system. Now the sun's surface temperature, remember we talked about really high temperatures because this is basically just a huge ball of burning gas. The sun's surface temperature is around 5,800 Kelvin and the core temperature reaches 15.6 million Kelvin. So at the very center it's very, very, very hot and even on the surface it's still 5,800 Kelvin which is really hot. At the core the density is more than 150 times the density of water. So we compare densities to the density of water here whenever we're getting specific gravity and things like that. So as a basis, the density of water, think about that, it's 150 times as dense as water at the center, at the core of the sun. So it's a very dense area and it's a very hot area. Now let's talk about different parts of the sun and what they're called. The surface of the sun is called the photosphere. So that would be like its outermost layer, the photosphere. And then beyond the, the photosphere, which is the surface of the sun, we have the chromosphere. And the chromosphere lies above the photosphere. And it's like a, another really hot region, but it's not actually a part of the sun. Where the photosphere is the surface, the chromosphere is the area right around the surface, kind of thinking about like the atmosphere surrounding the earth. It's not a part of the earth, but it surrounds it. And the chromosphere kind of surrounds the sun in the same way. Next we have the corona. The corona extends millions of miles into space after the chromosphere. So you've got the photosphere, and then you've got the chromosphere kind of surrounding the surface of the sun, and then you have the corona just expanding into space and temperatures can reach over a million degrees Kelvin in the corona. So even though the surface is only 5,800 Kelvin, as it expands outward, um, the corona is taking on more of that heat coming off the sun and can reach up to a million Kelvin. And then you've got sunspots, which are relatively cool regions on the surface of the sun with temperatures around 3,800 Kelvin. So that's about 2,000 Kelvin cooler than the average surface of the sun. So these are relatively cooler spots and these can be seen as darker spots um, whenever the astronomers are studying the sun. And finally the heliosphere. It kind of required several descriptions. So first think of the heliosphere like a bubble surrounding the sun with the sun near its center. So the heliosphere expands outward. It's basically the area affected by the sun's particles, which are carried on solar winds. As the sun is heating up, it projects particles out, and they're carried on solar winds. And as far out as those particles go, that's the heliosphere. The heliosphere is as far out as the sun's particles are going, as far out as the sun's effects are being felt. And that area extends far beyond Pluto. So that is the heliosphere, everything affected by the sun, basically a big bubble that branches out from the sun with the sun near its center. So the sun is at the center of the heliosphere, but it's also the center of the solar system. So it's what all the planets in the solar system are revolving around, and it's made up of the gases hydrogen, helium, primarily hydrogen, with a few various metals, but since stars are going to be giant balls of gas burning, primarily hydrogen and helium. It is a really big star in the Milky Way galaxy, but it is also um, the star closest to Earth, which makes it so bright for us. And it represents over 99.8% of the total mass in the solar system. So it is really big in comparison to everything else in the solar system. You think Earth's big. You think the other planets near us are big. The sun is way bigger than all of that. It, it making, it's making up 
over 99%, 99.8% of the mass. So everything else is just 0.2% of the solar system. So the sun is really big, a really big star that is at the center of the solar system and also at the center of the heliosphere. The heliosphere being everything the sun affects, the whole bubble expanding outward from the sun. Scientific notation. Scientific notation is used to write larger numbers in a shorter form. And the form is a times 10 to the n, where a is a number that is greater than or equal to 1, but it's less than 10. And n is the number of times we must move the decimal and in which direction. Let's take this number, 230,400,000. It's a pretty big number. We can write this in scientific notation by taking our decimal, which is at the end of our number, and moving it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 places to the left so that our number is now 2 and 304 thousandths. And you see my A is a number between 1 and 10. 2 and 304 thousandths is greater than or equal to 1, but less than 10. Times 10 to the 8th. And this number is the same as my original number. We can also use scientific notation to take very large decimal numbers and write them in a shorter form. We do the same thing. Our A has to be greater than or equal to 1 and less than 10, which means we need to move our decimal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 places to the right so that it becomes 2 and 304 thousandths times 10 to the negative 5. And that negative exponent lets you know that that's a very, very small number. It's a decimal. It's less than 1. Whereas a positive exponent tells you that it's a very large number. We can use these exponents to compare our numbers very quickly and easily. Looking at these two numbers in scientific notation, I can tell that 1 and 51 hundredths times 10 to the fifth is the larger number because it has the larger exponent. So it's a great method for very large and very small numbers. Simple machines. Simple machines do not have an internal source of energy, but they provide a force known as a mechanical advantage. And this mechanical advantage allows you to get a job done more easily. So while they don't provide any energy on their own, once you provide some energy, they help provide a force that makes the job easier to get done. Simple machines can combine with other devices and movements to form complex machines. So any machines that you know of are going to be made up of one or more of these simple machines. And simple machines include the lever. The lever is a stiff bar that involves moving a load around a pivot point. And this pivot point is known as the fulcrum. So to give you an idea of what a lever is as a simple machine, it will be pliers. It has two levers working around that pivot point in the middle to be able to do a job easier. Scissors, same thing, two lever levers around that fulcrum. Crowbars, um, once they get in where they're trying to move things, what they push against becomes where the pivot point or the fulcrum is and you applying your energy at the end of the bar 
provides more force at the far end of the bar so that you're able to pry up whatever you're trying to pry with the crowbar. And teeter-totters. You have the fulcrum located in the center, loads on either side that are able to move more easily. Um, you're able to move, lift up, bounce another person, where if you were on the ground trying to lift them straight up, you would not be able to do that. But with the lever and the help of the fulcrum, you're able to bounce them up in the air, at least raise them up several feet off the ground. Next we have the pulley. And the pulley uses grooved wheels and a rope to raise, lower, or move a load. And the grooved wheels have a groove in them to hold that rope so that the rope stays around the wheel and the wheel helps move the rope which will be attached to a load and it'll help raise, lower, or move it. Examples include the flagpole. You pull on the rope, it rotates around the wheels and it pulls the flag up way up into the sky without you having to climb up there and do it or carry anything. Clothesline, same thing. If you're pulling the clothesline forward, you can take pieces of clothes off, put them in the laundry basket, pull the clothesline some more, take pieces of clothes off, pull the clothesline some more, and it moves around a pulley system. And window blinds, same thing. You pull on them, they raise up because there's a pulley system up in the top part of your blind. So when you pull down, it's going to rotate up in the pulley system and pull the blinds up. Next, we have the wedge. The wedge is an object with at least one slanted side that turns a smaller force working over a greater area into a larger force. And it can also be used to cut material. And what that means is that whatever you have that's wedge shaped is going to be maybe like a triangle like that or if it sits flat on the ground it at least has this one slanted side and so if you put force on this end you're going to be putting all this force you're expending over this whole part onto just this one small area so it kind of um, focuses all that force onto the very end where the angled part is away from where the force is. So if you apply force here, it's all going to focus down at that point. So that's what it means by the smaller force over a greater area being focused into this one small area, but a great, a much larger force there. Um, some examples are a tire wedge. So people will wedge a tire wedge under their back tires or front tires to keep it from rolling a certain direction. So if the tire starts to move, it kind of pushes back and keeps the tire or keeps the car from rolling. A hand axe looks kind of like this and you would pound on something with it um, trying to cut it. And because you're applying a lot of force here, it's going to get focused here and you'll be able to cut things more easily. And a chisel uh, usually is going to involve using a hand tool as well to pound it, but you've got your chisel and you're pounding it, and all the force is getting focused at the end of the chisel. So you are actually getting the job done with less force than if you were actually having to cut or pound, whatever it is. Using those tools, um, these simple machines, you are able to get a job done using your mechanical advantage, which makes you be able to use less energy because you've got this force known as the mechanical advantage available from these simple machines. Next we have wheel and axle. The wheel and axle is going to be a wheel with a rod called an axle that goes through the center and it lifts or moves loads. This allows for movement with less resistance. Examples of simple machine or mm, examples of machines that use the wheel and axle are the bicycle, a doorknob, and a pencil sharpener. Oh, and a wagon. So the bicycle obviously has wheels. They are connected by bars of the bike, and there are actually going to be some other simple machines found in there, but that's one example for you. Wagon, same thing. You've got two wheels 
connected by an axle at the front, two wheels connected by an axle at the end, and it lets you move uh, whatever you put in that wagon a lot easier. If you tried to carry an armload of stuff that weighed 100 pounds, it would be really hard to do. If you put it in that wagon and dragged it along behind you, it'd be a lot easier. The doorknob, if you're trying to move the little latch in and out, it's going to be a lot easier if you just twist that knob than to try to hold the pressure or pull on the little pin that will keep the lever in and out from the inside. So the doorknob helps make that easier. Pencil sharpener, you're literally cutting away pieces of wood and you just have to crank on the side and then there's a wheel inside that has um, sharper edges that's going to be able to cut your pencil, but it's all wheel and axle based. These all include the wheel and axle simple machine. Now some of them do have other simple machines and that's why we talked about how you can combine several of these or all of these in some machines to form complex machines. You don't often use just a simple machine by itself. You combine it with other things to make your job even easier. Okay, another simple machine is our inclined plane. The inclined plane is a flat supportive surface that's going to be tilted at an angle where one side is higher and one side is lower and it's used to move heavy loads with less force. If you try to pick something straight up in the air, it's gonna be a lot harder to do than pushing it up a ramp, pushing it up an inclined plane. So examples would be a ladder. If you're climbing up a ladder that's inclined, you are able to go up easier than if you just tried to jump straight up or someone tried to pull you straight up. A wheelchair ramp lets people roll right up rather than try to bounce over stairs. Loading ramps, like on a truck, if you're trying to lift things and put them into a truck, if you could just roll them up a ramp, it would be a lot easier. And a slide, if you're going from top to bottom on a slide, you're going to be going a lot faster because you've got this inclined plane and you're getting down easier than if you just tried to jump. If you jumped off, not a safe idea, you can end up hurting some body parts, where if you slide down, you're moving down with a lot less effort than having to climb down or jump down. And last we have the screw. The screw is in itself an inclined plane that wraps all the way around a pole. So you've got your center pole with that inclined plane that wraps all the way around it, and it lifts things or holds things together. So obviously an example would just be a screw, that you screw into things to hold things together. You put a screw between two pieces of wood, holds them together. You've got screws that hold together different kinds of furniture at your house. Other examples would be drill bits. If you're drilling a hole for a screw, you use different size drill bits, but they all have an inclined plane around a pole, and it's basically a simple machine known as a screw that's making that hole for you. A lid jar. If you've got a lid and you screw a jar on or off, that is the simple machine known as a screw. A swivel stool or chair. If you have a chair that swivels, it's using the screw as a simple machine. So, all of these simple machines are able to combine with one or more of the others to form complex machines that you find all over the place today. Your simple machines are the lever, pulley, wedge, wheel and axle, inclined plane, and screw. Specific heat capacity can be shortened to just be called specific heat, and we can abbreviate that as a capital C. And that's the amount of heat energy that it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So it's a measure of a substance's ability to store and transfer heat energy. Each substance has a unique specific heat. Water has a relatively high specific heat, meaning that it can absorb or release large amounts of heat with a little change in temperature. In contrast, copper has a low specific heat. It absorbs or releases a small amount of heat with a large change in temperature. Now, you measure a substance's specific heat in a calorimeter. And this is where heat is transferred from a known mass of the substance to a known mass of water. The corresponding temperature changes of the water and the substance are then measured. So the equation for specific heat is this right here. Specific heat equals heat transferred divided by mass times 
change in temperature. So let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at an example problem. A 100 gram copper block absorbs 1170 joules of heat to raise its temperature by 30 degrees Celsius. So the question is, what is the specific heat of copper? Now, since we're looking for the specific heat here, this is a direct application of this equation right here. And so all we have to do is fill in the appropriate numbers. And so first we're looking for the change, um, the change in heat. So that would be 1,170 joules divided by the mass, 100 grams, and then times the change in temperature, which is 30 degrees Celsius. So I'll save you the math on this. The answer is 0 0.39 joules divided by grams Celsius. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at a more, uh, more difficult example problem. How much heat is required to change the temperature of a 25 gram of block of iron by 100 degrees Celsius? And then we're given the specific heat of iron. And so here, we're looking for the change in heat. So we're looking for Q, so we have to rearrange the equation to solve for Q. So here, to solve for Q, we're multiplying the mass times the specific heat of iron times the change in temperature. So now we just need to plug in the numbers. So we're dealing with 25 grams times the specific heat, which is right there, so 0 0.45. And then finally, we multiply it by the change in temperature, which is 100 degrees Celsius. And so then again, I'll, I'll save you the math, but the answer is 1,125 joules. And so the units here is just joules because we're looking at heat, and that's because Celsius um, and grams can both be crossed out there, so we're left with joules, which is the unit we need. So again, specific heat is the amount of heat energy that it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. The body contains two varieties of sweat glands, eccrine and apocrine. Eccrine sweat glands are ring ducts that run from the innermost layers of the skin to the body's surface. Also, eccrine sweat glands secrete sweat to cool the body. Apocrine sweat glands are larger than eccrine sweat glands. Now with apocrine sweat glands, these glands emerge from hair follicles under the armpits, areolae of the nipples, and around the genitals. Now, apocrine secretes sweat with oils and pheromones. Now, quickly about pheromones. Pheromones are chemicals that are detected by animals using their olfactory or smell sense. But going back to apocrine sweat glands, they are odorless sweat until it is exposed to the bacteria of the skin. I don't know about you, but I happen to like looking at clouds. Since I've been a kid, I've always enjoyed looking up, seeing the types of clouds are up there, looking for designs, um, similarities. Uh, hey, that looks like a castle, that looks like a person, that looks like a hippo. Uh, clouds are fascinating things. And today we're just gonna go over uh, types of clouds so that hopefully the next time you're outside and you think to look up, not only can you have fun enjoying the different uh, shapes and things that you see in the clouds, especially if it's sunrise or sunset with the way the sunlight hits it and changes the colors, but you'll actually be able to identify the type of cloud it is and understand a little bit uh, about what causes that type of cloud. So we're just going to go through those briefly. I'm going to list the type of cloud, the name of the cloud, and then give you a concept or word to associate with that type of cloud. So we'll begin by looking at stratus clouds. Stratus clouds, and here what you need to think of is a blanket, a blanket. What you have is a layer of very cold air and then a layer of warm air that rides over the top of that cold air and at the boundary between the cold air below and the warm air above, as that warm air begins to cool by coming into contact with that cold air, if it goes below the dew point, it, it uh, condenses out and produces 
a very uniform cloud uh, bank or layer at that boundary and it looks like a blanket. So these are stratus clouds, warm air riding over the top of cold air uh, producing this sort of blanket look. Next are cumulus clouds and cumulus clouds are the ones I tend to think of when I look up in the sky and I see different shapes and designs and whatnot. Here we need to think puffy, puffy clouds, cotton balls. Uh, this is basically warm air that is forced upward and as it goes upward it cools and condenses out into these big fluffy cotton ball like mounds. Cumulus clouds. And then finally the last type of cloud we're going to talk about today are cirrus clouds. Cirrus clouds are extremely high altitude clouds, seven kilometers above the surface of the earth. And essentially it's ice crystals at that level. So these thin ice crystals high in the atmosphere, the sunlight passes right through them. And here you need to think in terms of wispy, thin, feathery, as if someone had taken a paintbrush and sort of just scraped it across the, the sky there. Thin, wispy, feathery. And remember they are ice crystals at that level. So stratus, blanket, cumulus, puffy cotton balls, cirrus, wispy, thin, feathery. These are just uh, the basic types of clouds that you see. I hope you'll take some time not only to learn this information, but to actually go outside and look up. We get so busy. We're living our lives. We look everywhere but up. Look up. Look at the clouds and enjoy what you see there, especially if it's sunrise or sunset and you get the difference of the light and the colors and all that. And as you're looking, hopefully you'll remember blanket, puffy cotton balls, or thin, wispy, and feathery and go, oh, I know what that is, stratus cumulus or cirrus. Anyway, this has just been a basic overview of the types of clouds. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video, you'll find a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. And while you're on that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download.